Seahawks. But it has been anything but a routine last few days for the Seahawks. Thursday night, just a half mile away from the team's training facility, a vehicle with three Seahawks inside veers off the road, slamming into a utility pole. Speculation followed as to who was driving the vehicle. Police arrested all pro running back Chris Warren for investigation of vehicular assault after identifying him as the driver. But Warren, along with his agent, say rookie running back Lamar Smith, was operating the vehicle he owns. Warren sustained two fractured ribs. Smith, a chip fracture in his spine and fractured foot. And the most serious and tragic of the injuries, backup defensive tackle Mike Fryer, who suffered a fractured vertebrae. He underwent spinal surgery on Friday, but doctors say it is likely he'll never walk again. Emotionally distraught and nursing two broken ribs, Chris Warren is suited up and will play today. He and Smith were released from the hospital early Friday, and that's where Seahawk coach Tom Flores later made an emotional visit to see Fryer. But he was remarkably up for for the position that he was in, and uh, it was it was kind of it was a tough emotional time because you know, I said, "If there's anything I can do for you, let me know." And he said, "Win the game." I'm Dan Hicks with Todd Christensen. We're at the Kingdom in Seattle, where the fans here have not forgotten about the tragic accident which occurred Thursday night. And there is Chris Warren, along with Cortez Kennedy. Many of his Seahawk teammates have come up to him before this game, giving him a pat on the shoulder pad, and uh, only wonder what's going to the mind of Chris Warren. But Tom Flores told us yesterday, Todd, that uh, it would be Chris's decision whether he wanted to play. He's been physically cleared but mentally, it's a different story. Chris Warren has stayed away from most of the media all week, but he did release this statement exclusively to NBC yesterday, adding, I would like everyone to know that I was not driving the car at the time it was involved in the accident. My thoughts and prayers are with Mike Fryer, and I hope that everyone watching the game will say a prayer for him. Well, I think that the game is therapeutic for, for Warren. I don't think that there's, any, in my mind, there was no doubt that he was going to play Dan simply because of the fact that even though he does have the two fractured ribs, he needs to get out of the field. This is what he does. And he doesn't do Mike Fryer any good by sitting out, and that's not meant to be callous, but that's the reality of the situation. And as documented by Tom Flory's comment when he made the response that Fryer simply said, go out and win. Everyone talks about perspective, Dan, but the reality is that this goes on, the games go on. This is what Chris Warren does. This is the extension of his self-worth. This is why he needs to be on the field today. Three straight thousand yard rushing seasons for Chris Warren, and we will see whether Chris Warren actually starts this game. He will play, but Seattle will get the ball first on offense. The Seahawks have won the toss, and they will receive. Indianapolis's Dean Biasucci kicks off for the Colts, both teams at five and seven. Back deep for the Seahawks, Michael Bates and Terrence Warren. And although not in the thick of the playoff race, certainly alive today. And a victory is very big for each of these franchises. Biasucci's kick, a pretty good one. And Michael Bates will start from the two. Cuts up the left sideline across the 20, and Bates with a pretty good return will mark him out just across the 25-yard line. Damon Watts makes the stop. Chris Warren still on the sideline, so it appears he will not start in the Seattle Seahawks offense. And interestingly enough, if you, if you listen to the crowd, you can't hear much. I think they were really anticipating Warren coming out and giving a big cheer. So in the backfield for Seattle, will be Max Strong. He is a first-year player out of Georgia. And he is starting what appears to be his first NFL start. So the Seahawks from the 26. And fired to the air, batted away. It was intended for Strong out of the backfield incomplete. Trying to get to trying to get the ball to Paul Green underneath. This is something that Rick Meyer wants to establish early. And talking with Larry Kinn, an offensive coordinator for the Seahawks before the game, he mentioned that he didn't think the game plan would alter too much without Chris Warren, but I, I, I can't agree with that. I think that the reality is that Meyer is going to have to contribute today. He's not going to be just a subplot to this game. He's going to be key if the Seahawks are to win. On second down and 10, Meyer gets it to Strong, who fumbles the football. The Colts are after it. There has been no indication yet 
There's nothing but white shirts there. They and there is the it. indication. The Colts recover the ball inside the 20 on the fumble by Max Strong. Dan, is it just me or is there a Paul inside this stadium? I mean, not just the fact that it's these two teams who, as you mentioned, outside playoff possibilities. But this is ordinarily a Seahawk crowd is very loud, very vocal. Take a look in the middle. Middle screen read perfectly by Grant. Sarah Goose is the one who comes over and strips the ball. And it's number 61 who falls on top. But actually a very athletic play to come up with it. Except at the last minute, I believe Sarah Goose might have come in and got a piece of it. So a big turnover on the opening series by Seattle. And the Colts set up at Seattle's 18. Don Mikowski hands the ball off to Marshall Falk, who comes into the ball game just 43 yards shy from 1,000 yards. The Colts led by quarterback Don Mikowski, who gets his fifth NFL start after taking over for Jim Harbaugh. Up front, Cecil Gray gets his second start at right tackle for Zephyrus Moss, who is nursing a sore knee. And in the backfield, there is Falk, less than 43 yards away now from the magical 1,000. Dawkins in turn of the wideouts, and Mark Jackson comes in on the three wide out set. And this is Roosevelt Potts who has led the Colts rushing attack for the past two weeks. Seahawks on defense as that tackle was made by Cortez Kennedy on Potts. He had a season high nine tackles last week. Terry Wooden and Rod Stevens are trying to get a career high in tackles today. They could get that today, but the big addition back in the Seattle secondary is Patrick Hunter, who has been inactive eight games this year with a nagging hamstring injury. He's back at the starting spot. Terry Taylor and Raphael Robinson come in as the dime package. And this is Falk again. And Falk on third down and short might have picked up the first down and that would be first and goal for the Colts the stop made by Rod Stevens. Marshall Falk is somebody who has been has created somewhat of a one dimensional situation for the Colts in so much that clearly they want to get his hands on the ball but not to the expense of everybody else because when that happens other people start to lose interest. So what they've tried to do the last two weeks is to flex him out give him the opportunity to catch the ball get pots and carries but thus far it's been difficult to integrate that mix. And here's Falk again. And by the way, Marshall Falk has already eclipsed the five yards he needed to break Alan Amici's rookie rushing record. So not only is he looking for a thousand yards, but he's already eclipsed Alan Amici. Alan the horse Amici, the pride of Wisconsin. And of course, those who really are a little bit older will remember back in the 1958 great game between the Colts and the Giants. It was Alan Amici who plunged over for the winning touchdown in what they refer to as the greatest game ever played. Second down and goal for the Colts. Play action. Mikowski with plenty of time looking for the end zone and it's picked off. Patrick Hunter comes up with the interception. And now the crowd finally comes to life as Mikowski makes an absolutely atrocious throw. Patrick Hunter, the former, the former starter, coming over a hamstring injury in the back of the end zone makes the pick, setting up the Seahawks at the 20 when we come back. Now, we did not see Chris Warren in the first Seattle series, but he is in the huddle of Seattle's, and we will see him on the second series here, the first series. A fumble by Max Strong ended it, but the Indianapolis Colts not able to take advantage. Patrick Hunter comes up with the interception. By the way, that was his third of the season. And Dan, let's take a look at the reaction of the crowd when Chris Warren finally does get the ball. I think this is one of the more knowledgeable football crowds in the National Football League. It'll be interesting to see that first carry. And you can hear right now a little bit of the rising people starting to pay attention. He is the lone setback. And Warren gets the carry and maybe a yard. Tony Siragusa makes the stop on Warren. Well, don't. There it is. People are appreciative of the effort of Chris Warren. I mean, obviously, this is something where human interest is involved. People have to be concerned with the fact that what is his mental state of mind? Well, to update his physical state of mind, now does he have the broken wrist? But don't forget, he's been, he's been having a nagging hip injury over the last two weeks as well. So he is much less than 100% for this game. Meyer out of the shotgun. Looking across the middle for Kelvin Martin, it is incomplete. So 
So that'll bring up third down and 10 for Seattle. Well, as I mentioned earlier, here's a situation, Dan, where Meyer really is going to have to assert himself. I mean, just on the first carry alone, you can see that Chris Warren's tentative. Here's a situation where Meyer is really going to have to make some plays today. I mean, how tough is it to play with uh, two cracked ribs? A lot of people might be surprised that he's even in there. Meyer with time again, zipping it over the middle. Rob Thomas was back deep. Kelvin Martin was the receiver underneath, but... Neither one had a shot at the football. It'll bring up fourth and ten in the punting unit for Seattle. And Indianapolis has a Colt injured down on the field. It is number 61, Tony McCoy, the left tackle. Tony McCoy, of course, was the one earlier, along with Saragusa, who came up with that fumble. Give credit there to Eugene Good, though. He was an excellent coverage on Kelvin Martin. Certainly, Meyer had plenty of time to throw the ball. Watch number 42 and take a look if, if blocking is a problem. Pow! Take a look at the shot that Warren levels right there on number 95 of the Colts, Bernard Whittington. Okay. There is the flak jacket for the couple of fractured ribs for Warren. Well, having played with broken ribs, I can tell you that it's not fun. One of the things that happens is you cough or you breathe, and it really does cause some problems. But hopefully the adrenaline of the game will pick up for Warren, and he'll be able to overcome that pain. Seattle recently broke a six-game losing streak. It began with a loss to Indianapolis, but the Seahawks have won two consecutive one-point games over Tampa Bay the previous week and last week. A big win over Kansas City to up their mark to five and seven as you look at Tom Flores. So Rick Tootin will punt from his eight, and it's Duell Brewer back deep for the Colts. Comes up to the 42, fumbles the football, back pedals. Fumbles it again. The Seahawks will recover. Or will they? It's still loose. Big mistake on the part of Tracy Johnson. A great strip, great coverage of the ball. Tracy Johnson all by himself just fall on the ball. Instead, he tries to pick it up, run with it, and he drops it. Take a look. It goes through Brewer's hands. Plenty of time to pick it up. But take a look at the effort of Spitalski, who not only is able to pick him up, but strips him of the ball. Now look at Johnson. Just fall on it. But no, he tries to pick it up. And then, of course, Raphael Robinson it bounces off his legs. And how unfortunate for the Seattle Seahawks. Lucky for the Colts, who set up now at the 26. The leaders. Indianapolis begins its series. Marshall Falk around the right end. 11 8 left in the first quarter. We are scoreless. Big mistake on the part of Tracy Johnson. The Colts are all going the other direction, so Johnson is thinking, look, there aren't going to be enough white shirts. Spatulski with the great strip. Now watch number 43. Right there, Robinson comes in. It bounces off his leg. There's really only one white shirt, and that's Leonard Humphreys hustling back to make a big recovery for the Colts. Marshall Falk, who picked up three yards, is now slotted to the right. And Makowski goes over to Floyd Turner, and Turner makes the reception. Turner was the one that, if you recall, in the interception to Patrick Hunter, really didn't make much of an effort, Dan, and I thought he could have at least got a hand up to bat it away from Hunter. Instead, he didn't. This is the issue that, we that I made reference to earlier. They've got to get the ball in the hands of people like Turner and, and Sean Dawkins and some of the others. Otherwise, they lose interest if Marshall Paul is the entirety of the offense. Turner, the second leading receiver, but first among the wide receivers for the Colts, and he picks up the first down. play action by Mikowski wants to go over the middle for his tight end Kerry Cash and Cash not able to stretch out and get it talk about spreading the ball around it's the tight ends who have caught just a couple of passes in the last five games for the Colts take a look at the numbers here with regards to offense of course Barry Sanders everybody's aware of him and you think of them as being a one-dimensional team but take a look at Marshall Falk 41.1 percent of the offense that is a great deal and of course right below him Chris Warren of the Seattle Seahawks safe to say Dan I'm going to take a wild guess if they're going to get their hands in the ball today we'll see there's Marshall Falk with his fifth carry of the game and Falk is across the 40 out to about the 42 yard line it'll bring a third down Joe Nash the 13 year veteran brings him down well, Marshall Falk has struggled in the last two weeks running the ball in an effort to get him the ball out on the flank. They have not been giving him the ball. You can see nearly 10 fewer carries and nearly 50 yards left than his averages in games 1 through 10. Ted Marshall Broda made reference to the fact that they need to rectify that. He needs to get more involved in the running game. 
And as I say that, he's in the slot. Now, Marshall Falk, uh, season low 11 carries last week. He only had 48 yards rushing on third down. Mikowski over the middle, in and out of the hands of Floyd Turner. And it will be incomplete. That will bring up fourth down. Eugene Robinson, the defensive captain for Seattle, makes the hit. And the man from Colgate, Eugene Robinson, all pro free safety last year, will be the first one to tell you he has been not making enough big plays. They come with the blitz. Robinson, a man for man coverage on Turner, just separates him from the ball with a big hit. Robinson, of course, gets his reputation for making the interceptions. But here's a guy over the last three seasons has averaged over 100 tackles. You can see right there, he can hit you. So we get a look at Ron Stark, the left-footed veteran. Kelvin Martin comes up to the 20. Martin straight up the middle, just across the 30-yard line. 9-24 left in the first quarter between the Colts and Seattle. We're scoreless. Has three career fourth-quarter comeback wins. He's had two in the last two weeks. Well, that's uh, that's lovely. <laughs> But the still, reality is, is that, you know, he still has to assert himself. He's going to be inextricably linked with Drew Bledsoe in that draft and some of the things Bledsoe's been doing. People are waiting for Meyer to do the same thing here, but it's a very different offense. Meyer, one of four in the early going and passing. Seahawks begin at the 31, and Chris Warren this time gets a couple of yards. Tony McCoy, the left tackle, brings him down. So Rick Meyer leads the Seattle Seahawks up front. Ray Donaldson in his 15th year anchors a huge offensive line, which averages well over 300 pounds. Max Strong started this game in place of Chris Warren, but we've seen Warren the last two series. Blades may be on his way to another Pro Bowl season. He has 399 career receptions, and Michael Bates comes in as the third wideout. It will be second down and eight. And a pitch to Warren. With some good yardage across the 40 up to the 41, very close to a first down. Radisic makes the stop. The Colts defensively. Tony Bennett leads the team with seven sacks, but he hasn't had one in the last six games. Jeff Harad is nursing a couple of sore ankles, so Scott Radisic gets the start. And in the secondary, Ray Buchanan, an emerging cornerback, has an interception in his last in each of his last three games, and Damon Watts and Ashley Ambrose come in in the dime package. Just as I had mentioned earlier, I stand a little bit corrected. It seemed to me that Chris Warren was very tentative in his first two carries. But the left side of the line, particularly Ray Roberts, blew some people out there, and he looked like he had a head of steam going, trying to assert himself. Warren just short of the first down. He was held to a season low 53 yards last week. But he's the second leading rusher in the AFC. And he's also second in the conference with over 1,400 yards from scrimmage. Well, Dan, that, that supports my point with regards to Meyer, and that is, is that he's, he's got to make some plays. You cannot be one dimension. You just can't expect Warren to come up with 100 yard games every time out. Warren trying to pick up the first down. He'll easily pick it up. So after sitting out the first series, uh, it's apparent that uh, Warren is in the plans on offense for Seattle today. It, interesting, too, here, when you have your forward lean, you're anticipating getting hit. If Chris Warren had his normal stand up right here, he might break it. But all he's concerned about right there is getting the first down and having so much of the lean, he did not get a chance to utilize his vision, break to the outside in what could have been a very big play. As you look at the season numbers for Chris Warren, the only running back to ever record three straight 1,000-yard seasons all on losing teams. Here he is again, up the middle. Good hole, good blocking by the offensive line up front. Radisic, along with the free safety Jason Belser, combined on the stop. Well, you mentioned the fact that three straight with losing teams. That remains to be seen, of course, here in the 94 season. They still have a shot at getting a winner. But if the offensive line continues to block like this and give the gaps to Chris Warren, then he's looking at possibly another 100-yard day. And Warren, again, is sixth carry of the game, and he's got another first down. He is inside the Indianapolis Colts 45. Tony Siragusa makes the stop on Warren. Take a look at Blackshear and Roberts double-teamed down. He comes off on Radisic. That's the block right there. 
It appears from that vantage point the Radisek's a part of the play, but Roberts pushes him off by five yards, and they'll certainly take that, making tackles six yards down the field. Warren averaging better than five yards a pop. Six and a half minutes left in the first quarter. No score. Quick drop by Meyer, but he's flushed out, looking for Brian Blades along the sideline, but Meyer simply throws it away, and that'll bring up second down. Big matchup today is going to be between Brian Blades and Ray Buchanan. Take a look at Brian Blades. Cuts, cuts in. He's on the outside, on the out and up, but Buchanan isn't buying it. Look at him right eye to eye with him. He sees that he's not going to be fooled by that minor out move. And as you mentioned, interceptions in consecutive games. Former free safety who wanted to move to corner, and quite frankly, I'm surprised that he didn't earlier. To me, the quarterback is much more valuable than free safety. Here's Warren again. And Warren with some more good yardage. There have been seven plays on this drive, and Chris Warren has gotten the call for six. Well, he's right behind the big bodies, as you mentioned earlier, Dan, averaging nearly 315 pounds a man pulling out. Take a look at the big bodies on the big bodies. That's all there is to it. Howard the House Ballard, 330 pounds. Look at him, how he pushes the pile. That's supposed to be illegal, but you rarely see it called. That actually gave Warren an extra yard. Former pro bowler of the Buffalo Bills, signed as a free agent this season. And aptly nicknamed the House. Third down and five. Meyer to the near sideline. Kelvin Martin has his first reception of the game, and it's good for a first down at the Colt 27. Great. Ashley Ambrose on the coverage. Great throw by Rick Meyer. Take a look at the coverage by Ambrose. He's just behind him a step. Watch the right arm. Just a little bit too late getting in. Throw right on the money by number three. And the combination from Meyer to Martin, good for 11 yards. As you see, Rick Meyer looking at the playlist on his wrist. Offensive coordinator Larry Kennan has a similar play list on the wrist. Meyer wanted to go over the middle to the Warren, or was that Blades? Apparently Blades was the intended receiver, but the Colts knocked it down. Take a look at number 42. Chris Warren is going to be the one who's going to bounce through just underneath. He's just trying to lob the ball under there. Getting up and batting it down is Tony Bennett. A lot of cases, you know, there's a situation where the guy can bat down passes if he's not getting the good pass rush. In that case, that was what happened. Ray Roberts had stuck him at the line of scrimmage. That enabled him to have the angle to jump up and bat it down. Pitch, Warren left side. This time looking for a hole, not much there. He gets down to the 25 before Quentin Coriot comes in to make the stop. And that was a great play by Quentin Coriat. He fought off two different blockers, first the tight end and then the fullbacks that make that play. Coriat over 100 tackles again here in 1994. But the question is not so much the tackles where Coriat is concerned, it's the big plays. Does what he do justify being the second pick of the draft a couple of years ago? And basically, Dan, the jury's still out. The Colts' second pick in the first round of that 92 draft. The second pick overall is was Steve Benton. He is here today but he had neck surgery on Monday. But on third down, here is Warren, and Warren is inside the 20. Stephen Grant wraps him up. Interesting call there, but it turned out to be a, a, a good call in terms of getting a little bit closer for the field goal, basic draw play out of the shotgun. Corey out and Grant get there, but a little bit late. Now that'll set up a 36-yarder, very makeable by the left footer Casey and there is John Casey junk in the snapper the punter Rick Tootin is the holder it was Casey who had the 32 yard field goal which won it last week over Kansas City this officially from 37 and Casey has the field goal he's been hot and very consistent 14 of 16 on the season. Seattle with a 37-yard field goal by John Casey has the lead with 3.33 left in the first quarter. And Casey will kick off that deep for the Colts. Duell Brewer in Ronald Humphrey. Chris Warren figuring uh, very big 
in that 12 play drive. He had the ball nine of the 12 plays before the field goal. Well, that's certainly more than the 38% graphic that we put up earlier, isn't it? Uh, a little bit. Nine out of 12, 75%. Hey, that mask paying off. And this will be Ronald Humphrey who loses the football and is loose, and the Seahawks have it. Warren recovers the fumble. One of the first things to consider is why not let the ball go out of bounds? Left-footed kicker, the ball's hooking. If he lets it go, it probably goes out of bounds, but right there, kick it out of bounds. If you can't pick it up, just kick it out of bounds. Take a look at the end of the play. All right, you can't get it. Now you know you're not going to get very many yards. Just kick it out. Don't try and pick it up and make a play. Kick it out of bounds. Don't worry about it. Let your team set up at the 18-yard line. Oh, Terrible the, mistake. The third turnover of the game. There have been two. As Warren play action fakes it to Warren. Goes for the end zone. Paul Green, touchdown. Larry Kent, an offensive coordinator, instead of the standard thing, give it to Warren. Play action pass, has people frozen. Paul Green gets in the center of the zone. Nice throw by Meyer. Does not take the Seahawks long to take advantage of the Ronald Humphrey turnover. 18-yard touchdown pass to Paul Green. His first of this season and just his third career. With 322 left in the first quarter is out to a 10-0 lead. Take a look at the linebackers and what they do with the play action fake. There they jump in front. Look at the middle of the field. There's nobody there. Right between the two deep zone. Paul Green makes the catch. Effort by Tate to bat it down, but it's a little bit too late. And Rick Meyer has his 11th touchdown scoring play of the season. And Larry Cannon, offensive coordinator, former coach of the London Monarchs, who won the World Football League a couple of years ago. Also, he was a receiver and quarterback coach for the Los Angeles Raiders during my playing day. Excellent call there, and very a little bit offbeat for the Seahawks, who were getting painfully predictable in that first series. Not to mention the former Colts offensive coordinator under Ron Meyer back uh, in 89 and 90, as we take a look at Rick Meyer, the Completion percentage, uh, just 51% this season, but this is his quote last week after facing Joe Montana. And an interesting point with regards to this is last year, remember, as Rookie of the Year, everybody knew who he was. He talked about a strange feeling when they're here to watch the other guy, Joe Montana. Well, last year when he was Rookie of the Year, everybody talked about Rick Meyer. Not so this year. He has dwelt in somewhat of an anonymous pose as a result of the fact that the team losing six straight and, of course, the emergence of Chris Warren as a is a legitimate superstar. You know, he had all those those big numbers last year, but he's just had two games of, of 200 or more passing yards all season. How about this? 10 points in 11 seconds for the Seahawks. Well, if you're Ted Marchabrota, you can't be very happy about it. I mean, that was just a gift seven points from the Colts. They, because of the way their offense has been going, they cannot afford that largesse. There's Ted Marchabrota, 3-0 in his career against the Seahawks. And in his second stint as head coach of the Colts. Casey sends it to Duell Brewer from the five. And Brewer gets it out to the 25, where the Colts will begin another series. Well, tonight, Robin Williams, Jeff Bridges, and Austin Tane. And, of course, one scene that you might want to pay attention to, not to give away too much, is the two of them in Central Park, laying down, watching the stars completely unclothed. Well, here's Marshall Fox, still trying to get to the 1,000-yard mark. I believe he came into the series needing 29 yards. He picks up a good gainer there, stopped by Eugene Robinson. 
Marshall Falk listed at 5'10 and a little bit over 190, depending upon what he had for lunch. People think of him as a scat back. Watch him lower his shoulder and show the power as he breaks through two tackles to get an additional five yards. Now with that run, he is 15 yards away from the 1,000-yard mark. And Falk is split to the near side at the bottom of your screen. And this is Roosevelt Potts. You mentioned uh, Potts. The big six foot two hundred and forty five pounder in his second year out of northeast Louisiana leading this club in rushing the last two games including last week's seventy four yards on just six carries. Well Dan that's great he led the club in rushing last year with over seven hundred yards but big deal didn't we spend seventeen million dollars to get somebody named Marshall Falk he's got to be back there I appreciate the fact that he has versatility he can go to the slot periodically but he's your go to guy. They've got to treat him the same way that they treat Thurman Thomas. And Ted Marshall Broder should, should know that because Ted's the one that made Thurman Thomas there in Buffalo. Potts picks up the first down, first and ten, and Mikowski fires to the far side. Sean Dawkins makes his first catch of the game. Patrick Hunter on the defensive coverage. When they drafted Sean Dawkins first out of the University of California, they anticipated that this was going to be their go-to guy. And I asked him last night, something that you're seeing in the NFL a lot now is because of the bump rule, they're having people just go down and throw the ball up a la alley-oop in the old days of R.C. Owens and Y.A. Tittle. Do they have that play in the offense? I asked Sean Dawkins. He said no. I was surprised. He's got five yards. And second down and five. Bach this time split to the right at the top of your screen. And Mikowski just gets rid of it in time to Floyd Turner. Mikowski, sensing the pressure, gets rid of it. Turner picks up the first down, but the Magic Man really paid the price. But that's a veteran quarterback that can do that. A lot of quarter, the younger quarterbacks can't hang in there. But Mikowski hangs in there, delivers the ball to Turner, and takes the shot. Take a look at the top of your screen. Good block there by Potts to get Rufus Porter, but here comes Wooden, completely untouched. Puts the hit on Mikowski. Take a look at how he lands right on the crown of his head. Now, don't forget that something that's been happening constantly throughout the league is concussions. Meyer even had one earlier, of course, Joe Montana, some of the other quarterbacks, Neil O'Donnell, on and on. And there is Rick Meyer, who says he took two of the three biggest shots of his young career last week and described himself as just a bit goofy, he had to come out of the game for a series or two, and now Don Mikowski shaking up as we take another look. Well, as I mentioned, Potts with a good block, but there's just no way that they can get Wooden. Misdirection takes the hit. Now watch the head at the end and how he lands. You can do as much as you can to legislate against the injuries to quarterbacks, but the reality is, is that in contemporary football, the name of the game, quite frankly, is kill the quarterback. And if you ask defensive coordinators league-wide, they're going to say the same thing. We've got to put the pressure on these people coming with six and seven guys. And, and Todd, some pretty wild talk this week as we take a look at the back of Jim Harbaugh about even some kind of sin bin uh, as as the NHL has but putting a defensive player in a penalty box I mean some wild conversation but has it has it come to that well th th that's what they're trying to do but the reality of that is what's going to happen are we going to power play field goals I don't think so what I do what I do think what I do think is that Quarterbacks, what's going to have to happen is despite the millions of dollars these quarterbacks are getting, during practice time, they're going to have to take some collisions. And let me explain to you why. Throughout the preseason or throughout through practices, if you go to teams throughout the National Football League, quarterback always has on a red jersey, which means what? Don't touch him. Now when he gets any kind of collision out of the field, he's not conditioned to getting hit. That's the reason why we have so many injuries to the quarterbacks. Magic on the sideline, so Jim Harbaugh takes over. The ball at the Seahawk 45. He'll give it to Marshall Falk, who burst through the middle, and now it's a foot race. He's gone. He's gone. Forget it. Marshall Falk touchdown. And with that touchdown, the magic thousand-yard mark for Marshall Falk. Make it a thousand thirty yards for Falk. Well, it's, you know what, Dan? I'm sorry to interrupt you, man, but when you said it was a foot race, that's when I said it's over. <laughs> it's over. Marshall Falk, a legit, legit 4.28 to 4.31 in the 40. He has another gear. That one good for 45 yards, and Marshall Falk becomes the 27th rookie in NFL history.
a rush for a thousand yards and he gets it in a pretty good way as a nice little 45 yard score very impressive and Indianapolis back in the ball game as Dean Biasucci tries to tack on the extra point. The hold by Stark. The kick is good. And with 42 seconds left, the Seahawks lead cut to 10-7. Yeah, but give, give a little credit here to Kirk Loudermilk, Randy Dixon, and Joe Stanizak. Look at the middle of the line. Look at the cutback. Look at the bodies getting pushed off. Great job by the right tackle. The man replacing Zephyrus Moss. Good job there. Just tremendous job by so Cecil Gray. Don Mikowski, who took the shot. Jim Harbaugh comes in, hands off, and has a 45-yard touchdown play as the Magic Man uh, apparently looks all right. A little dazed. We'll see if he returns to the lineup. It was Harbaugh who, of course, started the first eight games before he was replaced by Mikowski. Mikowski uh, not only trying to shake off the effects of that hit, but he comes into the game with a banged up thumb. He's been wearing a protective cast of sorts on his right throwing hand. He looks like he's going to be okay. He's shaking it off. Take another look at the run at the end. I mentioned the offensive line play first of all with regards to Gray and how he pushes people off. But take a look once he's in the secondary. Even though he shakes the tackle there by Hunter. Now watch. He's not quite at full speed. Now there's a chance to get him, but no. Turner does a good job getting in front of Tony Brown, but it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Look at the gap that Falk had between himself and Tony Brown. Tremendous run and great speed. And with that, there are the Colts' 1,000-yard rushers. There Pretty have only been uh, three 1,000-yard rushers in Colts history. Now, along with Marshall Falk, it is four. Pretty impressive group when you look at that. Curtis Dickey, former All-American at Texas A&M. Eric Dickerson, everybody's well aware of his over 13,000 yards in the career, holding the single-season rushing record of 2,105 yards. Now Marshall Falk, a part of that very early group. The injury report on Don Mikowski, a next strain. His return is questionable. Via Succi to kick off. And this is Terrence Warren from just inside the five. Just across the 25. And Marshall Falk bringing up the fourth 1,000 yard rushing season in Colts history. A flag thrown on the kickoff. A little and bit of we'll holding. You can. Here's a little bit of holding. holding. Number 52 during the return. First down. Getting caught there. Watch Malway right there. Look at the shirt. Look at the shirt of Ambrose completely pulled out. Good call by the official all over number 33. <laughs> That's not a tough one to call. Johnny Greer, our referee today with a call. So the Seahawks will begin at the 15. Just goes to show that when you're a rookie, you saw Kevin Malway there in the huddle. When you're a rookie, you don't get to just start exclusively. You got to play special teams too. There in the wedge as well as playing guard for the Seahawks. There is number 52. A wise second round pick and a rookie out of LSU. And Chris Warren along the left side gets up to about the 19. Gain of four for Warren. Siragusa making the stop as the final seconds tick down in the first quarter. Very strange in terms of turnovers here in this first quarter, Dan. But the, two, the one thing that we mentioned be able to proliferate itself from quarter to quarter and that's going to be guys getting the ball Chris Warren and Marshall Falk. And that is the end of the first quarter at the Seattle Kingdom. Seattle holds a 10 7 lead. We're right back after these messages. Steve Entman who underwent neck surgery last week on Monday and for the third time in three years surgery ends Steve Entman season former number one pick back in 92 he took the team trip out here and will stay in the Seattle area where he has some family and friends this week Meyer flushed out he'll run looking for the first down marker and Meyer will pick it up Stephen Grant runs him out of bounds but not before Meyer picks up the first down to his, to his credit, Rick Meyer has run a lot less this season. Last year, if there was any kind of pressure at all, he took off. As we mentioned earlier, inexplicably linked with Drew Bledsoe because of the draft of 1993. You see the comparative numbers. The thing, obviously, that stands out this season 
for, for Meyer, of course, the least interceptions in the National Football League, whereas Drew Bledsoe has the most. But clearly, very different offenses. New England very dependent upon Drew Bledsoe to win the game for him. The Seattle Seahawks have the great runner of Warren. And here is Warren trying to pick his hole, but Rick Meyer had 17 interceptions last year and told us that, you know, I'm not going to gamble on those times this year when I, when perhaps I could stuff it in there last year. I took, a, took some more chances. This year, uh, I'm a more mature quarterback, and I'll hold up before I try to get the big play. Well, it's interesting, too, as we mentioned, the comparisons between Bledsoe and Meyer. Of course, today, the New England Patriots defeating the New York Jets 24 to 13, leaving them 7 and 6 with an outside possibility of making the playoffs. I think if Bledsoe leads that team to a winning season, that would be success in itself because of what's happened to that franchise last week. Meyer going downtown, just trying to throw it away. Brian Blades was down there, but Meyer clearly trying to throw it away. And David Tate tried to catch up with the football, but a flag has been thrown at the line of scrimmage and the holding call that appears indicated by Johnny Greer. Miscommunication here between Brian Blades and Meyer. Blades right here settles down on the hook route. You can see that he looks at it taking off. 75 so offense. Miscommunication Still second there. down. But it doesn't matter because Howard the House Ballard was caught holding. Holding on the house. I wonder if he gets tired of that. The you know house nickname? Yeah, that nickname. It's a great nickname. Well, no, sure it is. But, I mean, if you're that big, and how many times do you have to say, hey, big guy, hey, hey Mo, what's up? You know, I mean, that's got to get tired. I mean, I heard the story about one time Green Jabbar was in an airport and finally got tired of it, and someone said to him, how's the weather up there? And I guess he spit on the top of the head and said, it's raining. Fire <laughs> <laughs> flips it out. Paul Green, who caught the touchdown pass a few moments ago, quickly dragged down for appears to be a loss. Quentin Coriot drags him down. Well, Farrell Edmonds, the normal tight end, has had back problems. And Paul Green, who is a better receiver than Edmonds, is in as the starting tight end. But he is not the blocker that Edmonds is. Although, to be candid, certainly early in the game, it hasn't affected the running game adversely with Green at tight end. So now third down and 21. The Colts have the nickel package in. And Meyer works out of the shotgun. Michael Bates in as the third wide receiver. Low snap, four flags. False start, 73 offense prior to the snap. Still third down. So Ray Roberts called for the infraction. Ray Roberts. Former number one pick out of Virginia rocks back just a little bit. Good call by the official. Tough to play tackle in the dome sometimes, but quite frankly, it has been that noisy today. Yeah, it's so not. You really can't use that as an excuse. Well under the 65,000 uh, capacity crowd. As the Seahawk offense in reverse, third and 26 now. downfield for Kelvin Martin incomplete. It was Ashley Ambrose who was running with Martin step for step and that'll bring up fourth down and a chance for the Colts to get some pretty good field position. Well they're going against the best punter in the league in terms of net. You see that 29 inside the 20 that is second of the National Football League but his 37.9 nearly 38 yards net is the big issue where Tootin is concerned and remember two years ago in 1992 he had 108 punts which is either second or third all time. So he's a busy guy. He knows what it is to get the ball out of the end zone. And he's been uh, nursing a hamstring problem. Before the game, he had a apparatus wrapped around it. Not a great kick by him. But this is Duell Brewer who comes up at the 45 and gets it about to the 40. So a five-yard punt return for him. To 10 to 7. Uh, we got into the town of Seattle on Friday night. The, the tragic car accident occurred on Thursday night. And spent some time in the Seahawk training facility you could get uh, the definite feeling that it was much more somber than usual uh, the players having a very difficult time dealing with it I think so I think to say that it cast a pall over things is an understatement but as you mentioned and we discussed earlier it's therapeutic for these people to get out on the field and try as best they can to put it behind them Indianapolis trails it by three but with excellent field position here they'll begin at the Seahawk 40 Mikowski's pass complete inside the 20 to Sean Dawkins. So Mikowski back in the lineup 
after Jim Harbaugh handed off a 45-yard touchdown to Marshall Falk. So the Magic Man back in, and he's on the money. Well, a sprained neck may be an issue for a lineman who's got to put his face in, into somebody else. But for a quarterback, evidently it's not that big of an issue. It certainly didn't affect his arm. That was a laser beam over the middle. Dragged down behind the line of scrimmage. Terry Wooden makes the stop. Wooden closing in on a career high in tackles. Came into the game needing just four to achieve it. And uh, probably one of the best kept secrets in Seattle, Terry Wooden. Well, he, he's, he's one of those outside linebackers, you're right, who just plays everything well. The guys that make it to the Pro Bowl and everybody are the guys with the big sack numbers, but that's not what Wooden's about. As you mentioned, 103 tackles, a couple of interceptions, and a number of forced fumbles and recoveries. Playing outstanding football for the Seahawks, but not that many people know this, as you pointed out. Falk loses two, and Falk will lose at least one or two again. Antonio Edwards, the right end, making the stop. Well, just as the offensive line was so effective in the other series, right now they're struggling. The Seattle Seahawks defense guessing right in both situations. The Colts were one of nine on third down conversions last week in the loss to New England. It's now third down and 12. Picked off by Eugene Robinson. Robinson brings it out. It was intended for Sean Dawkins, but a poorly thrown pass by Don Mikowski. This is what a veteran free safety does. He baits the quarterback into thinking that he has an opening. Eugene Robinson, right in the middle of your screen, makes it look like he's not there, and at the very last minute, cuts in front of Dawkins and makes the pick. Well, now a flag has been thrown. Holding, 75, offense is declined. First down. So the interception stands for Eugene Robinson, the second pick of the day for the Seahawks. Hunter had the first one, and Robinson with a big one there, which stalls the Colts drive. Well, even though Johnny Greer pointed in the wrong direction, the reality was it was Cecil Gray who, with the whole... Watch the bottom of your screen. Here's Cecil Gray, number 75. Michael Sinclair with the arm under. Look at the hands. He pushes him to the outside. That's questionable, but they called it anyway. Doesn't matter. Interception makes it a moot point. Interception number three for Eugene Robinson. Seattle leads it by three. Seattle set up at the 15, and a pitch to Warren. knocked out of bounds on the far side. Don Mikowski, uh, two interceptions today, came in with just five. A flag has been thrown, and the holding call indicated by Johnny Greer. Well, Mikowski is somebody, you know, it's amazing how sometimes you can fall off the, uh, fall off the map. I mean, he was a guy that back in 1989 was the magic man, led the Packers to a 10-6 and six record, best that they'd had in something like 10 years, all pro, you know, pro bowler, threw for over 4,000 yards, not terribly happy about that two straight interceptions in the end zone and both atrocious throws, Dan. He has said that he is not the same. Holding since. 87 offense beyond the line of scrimmage. We will penalize from the spot of the foul. Still first down. Holding call on Paul Green, but Don Mikowski said, hey, I'm not the same since the rotator cuff uh, surgery back in, in 1990. Yeah, but Dan, he can't use that as an excuse, and he didn't. He said there are a lot of things that he does better because of the experience that he has, and he also made the point that having a gun for an arm in a lot of cases is overrated, pointing out the fact that four of the five members of the 40,000-yard club are guys that don't necessarily have guns for arms. First down and 15. Myers. Got his pass complete to Kelvin Martin. That'll get some of it back, but that'll bring up second down and long. Eugene Daniel on the coverage of Kelvin Martin. Kelvin Martin was the one who was supposed to come in and provide some speed as well as being a punt returner. That role has basically been transferred to Terrence Warren and Michael Bates, neither of whom have really been able to assert themselves. Martin and Blades are intermediate short route runners, effective nonetheless, but not people that can create the home run ball for you. scrimmage Tony McCoy led the Indianapolis surge 
Well, neither team is terribly effective in the passing game, as you can see. And in this day and age of contemporary football in the National Football League, you would think that over 200 yards a game is really not that big of a deal when week in and week out we're seeing 300-yard passing games. Now we have the chance to have maybe four guys who catch over 100 balls. These numbers here really don't stack up. And I don't know that you can necessarily point it to the quarterback, but in the final analysis, those are the guys who are going to take the blame if the passing is ineffective. Seattle, uh, 26 in the league in passing, and uh, passing down here on third and six. Meyer flips it out, and Brian Blades can't come up with a reception, and it'll bring up fourth down. He probably should have hauled that in. Ball's a little bit behind him. Meyer does a great job escaping the blitz from the left. Ray Buchanan comes in the corner blitz. Meyer sees it, escapes it. Now right there, the linebacker makes the decision to go after him. Poorly thrown ball. Blades, I think, feels like he could have come up with it, but Meyer should have delivered that a lot better considering the gap he had between the defender and himself. So Blades still without a catch as we approach the midway point of the second quarter. Rick Toot. Sends it high and calling for the fair catch is Duell Brewer at the 42-yard line. Seattle still leads at 10-7. Tom Mikowski uh, injured a ligament in his right thumb versus Miami earlier this season, but uh, has not missed a start. He's played with that protected cast every game since that injury against the Dolphins. Well, anyway, you look at it, that is the throwing. It would be okay if it was on the left hand, it's on the right hand. He says it's not so much of a bother, but as long as he has to win something. The pitch to fall. Terry Wooden on the stop. You mentioned earlier the numbers regarding Don Mikowski and what he had done earlier. You see his Pro Bowl season there. He's actually better in terms of completion percentage, but the TD to in interception ratio has changed today, Dan. I liked uh, the conversation yesterday. Uh, he says, Yeah, I like to throw deep. And you said, Well, you need speedsters to throw deep. And, uh, he came back with, well, we got that, but it's the old guy who needs to get the ball down to his speedsters. Mikowski in trouble here, and he'll go down at the 39-yard line. Sam Adams, the rookie out of Texas A&M, with a sack, but a flag has been thrown. Flag in the secondary. I think that was with Marshall Falk. Blackman had a man-for-man -man coverage. And it was clearly past the five-yard zone. Illegal contact, 94, defense, first down. So Sam Adams will not get the sack and the penalty on Stevens. Rod Stevens, the middle backer. Questionable is whether or not he was going to play today because he had a stinger. Take a look at number 94 in the middle of the screen. Coming across is Cash. Now right there, see, having been a tight end, I can tell you that they never called that during my time. I trust, trust me, they did. So first and ten from the 49. Mikowski quickly moving out of the pocket, but he's got Terry Cash. And Cash will be short of the first down. Robert Blackman on the coverage. Part of the problem with the cold offense has been Kerry Cash limping. You can see not noticeably he's actually limping back to the huddle. He's somebody who has had an ankle injury from the first game of the season. You see right there, even now, here we are deep some 12, 13 weeks into the season. Still tentative with that foot. Look at him gimping up to the line of scrimmage. And here's a guy that caught 43 passes the last two seasons and uh, comes into this game with just 13 total. Second down and short. Roosevelt Potts may not have gotten the first down. No, he wasn't even close. The entire Seahawk defensive front putting the clamps on Potts. Again, you question the situation with the one-back offense and Potts. I realize that it does spread the secondary when you have Falk spread out, and the idea is to get Potts the ball because he can't be an effective runner. But I'm, again, I'm surprised that we haven't seen much of Falk since the 45-yard touchdown run. And Mikowski's pass deflected at the line of scrimmage. It looked like the Tez got a finger on. Mikowski's pass, which was intended for Floyd Turner. 
Dan, I really have to question this. You've got third and one and a half. You've got Todd's a 250 pounder. You've got Marshall Falk, obviously a great runner, thousand yard rusher, and you have to fade back to pass. I just don't understand that. Take a look at number, number 96, fighting the double team, nonetheless times it out, gets his hand up and able to bat it down. People are questioning the Tez game with regards to desire. Mentioning the fact now that he's signed the big money, he has not been close to repeating the numbers that he had in 1992 when he had 14 sacks. Come on, baby, right there! Ron Stark trying to pin the Seahawks back deep, but the ball rolls into the end zone, and the score remains Seattle 10, Indianapolis 7. Dan Hicks, Todd Christensen back at the Kingdom in Seattle. The Seahawks with a 10-7 lead, and uh, Indianapolis has had some excellent field position this game, but the Colts have not been able to take advantage. Seattle begins this series first and 10 from the 20. Fire to the air, and this one is picked off. Ray Buchanan comes up with the interception, and he's still on his feet. Inside the 15, look at this return. Touchdown, Ray Buchanan. Wow. Ray Buchanan, the former free safety, moved to corner. Graduate of Louisville. What a run. Fire completely overthrown. Buchanan makes a great catch off the Aston turf to come up with it. You see Meyer coming off the field holding his wrist. He got absolutely hammered at the end by Jason Belzer with a terrific block. But Ray Buchanan is the one that made that play. Fifth interception of the year for Ray Buchanan. Four straight games now with an interception, and that ties a club record, which goes back to 1971. And who? Charlie Stoops. There you go. Number 47. Big play for the Colts. And Biasucci knocks it through for a 14-10 lead over Seattle. We'll take a look at Meyer as he overthrows the intended receiver. Watch number 34 floating into your screen. Gets down and makes the catch. Now watch when he gets up. It's almost as if some people are in quicksand. Watch number 29 is going to bounce up. That's Jason Belzer. You're going to get a chance to see him right at the end. Absolutely hammer the quarterback. But right there, offensive players are not known for their tackling ability or they'd be on the other side of the ball. Here he comes cutting across. Nobody is going to touch him. That is the second interception return for a touchdown for Buchanan earlier this year. Look at the block. Take a look at the hit that he takes. You saw that the foot the foot of Belzer actually stepped on Meyer's hand. We're going to see how much that's going to handicap him when he comes back out. This is a great catch. Oftentimes you don't see defenders make the great catch. It seems like every game that I watch at one point or another, a defensive back drops one in his hands. But Buchanan makes the most of his opportunity. Cutting across the field once again, let's take a look at the shot. The quarterback number three takes. Pow! That's Meyer adding insult to injury. Belzer knocks him down and falls on top of him. Take a look. Watch the left hand. It gets stepped on right there. You saw right at the end. Rick stepped on, and Meyer now is heading to the locker room. Yeah, we believe uh, that Rick Meyer uh, has headed into the locker room as we take a look at Ray Buchanan, who loves that cornerback position. He's, this is the third game in a row he has started at the left cornerback. He was a free safety. If we get a chance to take a look at that replay again, watch the left hand of Meyer and the foot of Belzer, and I believe that's what the injury is. He was holding it coming off. Watch the left hand at the end. Watch right there if we can stop it right. Look, pow, right there. Steps right on top of it. Ouch. Ouch. Not only just the weight, even though Belzer might weigh only 200 pounds, he's coming from a distance where he's up in the air, and the centrifugal force of that has got to cause some problems for the hand of Meyer. We will pass along uh, the injury report on Rick Meyer as soon as... That becomes available. The Colts with a 14-10 lead. Biasucci kicks off. And this is Michael Bates at the 11. Across the 35. And Bates out to the 38. 27-yard kickoff return for Bates. Finally, decent field position for Seattle. Well, does Dallas next Saturday. Now, Dan McGuire has come in to replace the injured Rick Meyer. His fourth appearance this season. And he'll keep it on the ground to Steve Smith, who has nowhere to go. Tony Siragusa makes the stop. Well, here is the AFC playoff picture 
up to date. The Pittsburgh Steelers won their game today over the Cincinnati Bengals 38 to 15. They figure to be in along with the Chargers, Cleveland, and Miami. So Pitch Pittsburgh clinches a playoff berth. Two weeks of big game there, Dan. Cleveland has to go to Pittsburgh. That'll decide the central of the AFC. McGuire swings it out to Chris Warren, and Warren will lose some yards. That shows the timing factor of McGuire is off. Trying to get out there in a loop pattern out to Warren. Took too long, threw the ball behind, and caused the loss. They are working on the left hand of Rick Meyer in the locker room, and as soon as we have a more definitive report, we'll pass it along. Tom Flores uh, told us regarding the tragedy that uh, this team really has to act as its own support group. He's not a big speech maker, and certainly he would not make one today in light of the tragic car crash on Thursday night. Seahawks trail 14-10. Wires first pass attempt to Kelvin Martin. He did complete the one out to Chris Warren, but it was a rush. But that is incomplete, and it brings up fourth down. Eugene Daniel with a nice defensive play in the Colts secondary. And remember what I said earlier about every game there's going to be a defender who's going to get a ball in his chest that he should have caught. Daniel certainly should have had that interception. McGuire threw it behind the receiver Martin. Daniel could have back-to-back -back picks for the Colts if he'd have held on. So Rick Took yeah. booms one. Duell Brewer backpedaling starts at the 10, and the Seahawks are all over it. Terrence Warren, great coverage. That's pretty much a special teams clinic right there. Booming kick, and the Seahawks taking advantage. Well, that's certainly the reason why Rick Tootin leads the league in net. It's just not his kicking, but the great coverage of the special teams by the Seattle Seahawks, something they've taken pride in over the last 10, 15 years. Cuts the left, but look at the speed of Warren. He'd have been better off just letting the ball go in that case, fielding the ball at the 10. Warren all over Brewer. 55-yard punt by Tootin. Loss of four makes for a 59-yard net. <laughs> That's Tootin going over to check the stats. Is that right, 59-yard net? Well, he booted a 64-yarder <laughs> last week. You know he's keeping an eye on those stats. So the Colts really pin back. They begin at the six. Paul loses a yard or two. Rufus Porter. Everybody's made an issue, Dan, over the fact that Dan Marino had such a problem getting back from his Achilles tendon injury. But Rufus Porter, the linebacker just to the right of your screen, just knives in completely untouched. He, too, had Achilles tendon surgery. And I would say more difficult for him because he plays a position that requires him to run and cut as opposed to quarterback. He has come all the way back with the exception of his pass rusher. That is not quite up to Paul. Gives the Colts a little bit of breathing room as he stretches out close to the 10. And the veteran Joe Nash, who had a season high six tackles last week, including a couple for losses, puts the stop on him. Well, coming up in the second half, we will have the complete AFC NFC right? playoff picture delivered by <laughs> Todd Christensen. Oh, no. We expect be... all the arithmetic, uh... all the numbers, <laughs> just to spew from your, from your mind. That will be Dan Prescott hit. <laughs> Third and six. And Falk on the ground again and looking for the first down marker. Well, he's going to be a little bit short, but that's still the right call. And the reason it is is Mikowski, for whatever reason, not as accurate as he would like. You don't want to take a chance of an interception. Give it to the good runner. Give yourself some gap. You've got a great punter in Ron Stark, 44-yard career average. Certainly the Colt fans might think they're not taking any chances here, but that's a good decision, the part of Ted Marcher brought in the offense and Cogna said it. Mikowski already with a couple of picks. And Ron Stark gets set to boot his third of the game, and Kelvin Martin back at his 40. Pretty good hanging punt. Martin at the 41. Sheds one tackle. A flag has been thrown as Martin gets back to the 48. Brian Radigan with a special teams tackle for the Colts. 
And we'll hear from Johnny Greer as to the penalty. Radigan making his own motion. He thought it was holding. A Colt is injured. And it appears it is Stephen Grant, number 59. Well, that's, that's a big injury. He's one of the three players on the defense, along with Harad and Coriat, that has over 100 tackles. And so if he's out, that means two of their starters, Harad and Grant, would be out. This could be a possibility, Dan, for them playing time for number one pick, Trev Alberts. Alberts, the rookie out of Nebraska. And we'll take another look at the Stephen Grant injury. Right at the end, there's number 59. He jumps up, lands in it. There he lands in his Anyone ankle just a little bit. Funny. The kick, we will penalize from the spot of the catch. Michael the number, Bates, is, uh, the Michael Bates is 81. You're right. Caught holding. We get a chance. If we can look again, take a look at the right foot of Grant. All of his weight is on the right foot. Watch just at the end. Take a look at his right foot. The man without his shoulder pad. Watch as his foot lands awkwardly. Pow, right there. All the weight is on that foot. Boy, that, that's got to hurt. Can't tell whether or not at this point if it's an ankle or a knee, but I know that hurts. Grant, 10th round pick out of West Virginia in his third year, has started the last eight games, and it's the first of his career. Look at the vertical by Grant. Look how high up he is when he lands. Ouch. Good to see that he's coming off, though, basically under his own power. Well, Trev Alberts is on the sideline. We mentioned the possible more playing time for him. He dislocated the right elbow in the preseason opener, had surgery in August, was expected to miss the remainder of the season, but he returned last week and appeared in about 25 plays for the Colts, and uh, was pretty impressive. Was pretty impressive. Had a sack and had, I think, three or four tackles. He did a pretty good job coming in, but they just don't feel like, certainly, that he's ready to play full time. 3.16 left in the first half. The Colts on top, 14 to 10, and Dan McGuire will have his second series as the replacement for the injured Rick Meyer. And he won it for Green, poorly thrown behind Green. Way down. Here are the linebackers that we mentioned. Of course, the big loss, Jeff Farad, headed for a 200 tackle season. You mentioned the sore ankles. Corey at 106, and of course, Grant that we just saw coming off. So. It might behoove the Seattle Seahawks to get their running game going again with Chris Warren because they're going to, there's some problems now in the linebacking core of the Colts. As they continue to work on Grant. Second down and 10. Warren. And Warren across the 35. That'll bring up third down. Devon McDonald on the stop. He's the reserve linebacker behind Stephen Grant in his second year out of Notre Dame. He was a fourth round pick a year ago. Well, as I mentioned, that seems to be the way to go. Get Warren the ball, and, and clearly you can see on the on the throws that McGuire has had so far, his timing game's way off. go to the air again and this time it's complete Brian Blades with career reception number 400 his first of the game today Ray Buchanan brought it down well you can say maybe they weren't looking his way or maybe Buchanan has had great coverage for whatever reason this is only the first catch 65th of the season for Blades deep into the first half good job of setting up on the hook route and McGuire able to deliver that one on the money there it is, number 400 for Blades. First and 10, McGuire backpedals in the pocket again. And this time, once Blades down the near sideline, Blades came back to the ball and makes the catch. And that is what makes Brian Blades the receiver he is. For some reason, Dan, we're seeing an awful lot of this. Blades, actually, great coverage by Buchanan with him stride for stride. But, but Blades is the one that looks back first. He's the one able to make the adjustment, so he's the one that makes the catch. Seeing an awful lot of this happen in the National Football League. Now I want to ask you a question. If Brian Blades is the defender, 
and Ray Buchanan is the offensive player. Is this pass interference? He pushes him to the side, comes back and gets the ball. I guarantee you, Dan, that if it's reversed, that's interference. That's one of the problems now with the new bump rule in the National Football League. The receivers have carte blanche to do what they want. Well, it goes as a 36-yard gain, first and 10 from the 18. Warren gets one. We have the injury report now on Rick Meyer as he is hit there. A fractured left thumb and his return is questionable well the issue here Dan would be whether or not it's not so much obviously he's right-handed but can he take a snap you know the concussion of the ball hitting his hand would be the big issue maybe if he switches and has his right hand on down. top he might be able to get away with it but this is pure speculation by us we'll have to say. Dan McGuire continues to fill in second down and now ball at the 17. Wired to the air, and this time over the wrong shoulder of Kelvin Martin. Eugene Daniel on the coverage, but uh, that one could have been holed in had it been on the mark to Martin. Well, in fairness to him, take a look at Tony Saragusa in the middle. He is all over McGuire, and he has been doing a great job of pass rushing from the nose tackle position. Look at him coming off the block, but you're right. McGuire completely behind Martin and had him there. Well, McGuire came into the game with just four passing attempts all season. People, they all came last week. But people, some people have talked about what a great preseason he has, but quite frankly, Dan, that has no application in the regular season. We'll see why here. Quick drop, quick kick, Brian Blades complete. That'll bring up fourth down, and uh, we will see John Casey come on to attempt a field goal as we approach the minute mark of the first half. That's a good call by Vince Tobin, defensive coordinator of the Colts there. He comes with the blitz. McGuire knows that he has his blitz pickup. But so does Ray Buchanan. The quick throw means it's only going to be a four or five yard gain. That's exactly what transpired. Great job of the Colt defense there in that series. John Casey, who uh, described his winning kick last week as uh, an ugly kick to win an ugly game, as he knuckled it in for the winning uh, field goal. And he'll be on to attempt another one to try to get the Seahawks another three points. Action. Wire goes quickly quickly to his blitz read. But Blades doesn't have enough running room. Buchanan right with him. Take a look at the isolation. Buchanan comes on the blitz, comes to him. But Belzer does a great job of coming from the free safety position and nailing Blades before he can get the first down. So Casey will attempt a 31-yarder. He's already got a 37-yard field goal on the board. And this one is pushed through. So the Seahawks add another three points and pull within one of the Colts, 14-13, with just 43 seconds left in the first half. And we'll remind you that our Super Bowl coaches, Joe Gibbs and Mike Ditka, will be in our NFL Live studios along with Greg Gumbel for the Domino's Pizza NFL Live halftime report. Week number 14, scores and highlights around the NFL. That's coming up at halftime. Now, this is a big issue here with regards to the franchise quarterback of the Seahawks, the left hand. Belzer stepping right on top of the thumb, fractured thumb. Boy, that's that, that that's tough to take, adding insult to injury after the interception. There you see him on the sidelines with the ice all over that thumb. I, I you know, if, if that's the way it is, I, they say questionable. I, I, don't, I, I don't see, see much happening yeah, with that on see, there. I don't see any therapy there and talking about him coming back in the game game's going to be in the hands of McGuire. Now, interesting interesting here with regards to the Colts, Dan, is that despite the struggles of Mikowski, knowing that they would go in up by a point, they still called timeout there after the third down to see what they could get a return, set up the possibility of moving themselves. So Ted Marshall Broda very subtly there saying that he has some confidence as quarterback despite the problems he's had here in the first half. making the stop for the Colts. And we'll remind you that Todd Christensen will have every possible <laughs> playoff combination, hopes, everything coming up in the second half as we dissect the latest up-to-date playoff picture. And if for whatever reason that I do not, then we will, I will defer to Dan Hicks who will give you some fabulous impersonations of well-known broadcasters. <laughs> 
Okay. Thirty-nine seconds left. Mikowski is over the middle, and he's got Floyd Turner, Raphael Robinson there, quickly to make the stop. As we're below thirty seconds left, Mikowski hurries up the Colts. And a quick give to Falk, and Falk bounces out for the first down. And the Colts will call a timeout. That stops the clock with 14 seconds. Now, if anybody knows how to utilize the hurry-up offense, it certainly would be Ted Marshall Broda, the architect of the K-gun there in Buffalo. Good call there to Marshall. Falk gets the first down. Now they're at their own 40-yard line. They've got two shots basically to get it into field goal range here with Mikowski. And I like what Ted Marshall Broda is doing here for a couple of reasons. First of all, not only putting a little pressure on the Seattle defense, but it's also giving Mikowski the feeling of confidence. He struggled early in the game, had the interceptions. Ted Marshall Broda understands the psyche of the quarterback. And so Mikowski, if he completes a couple of passes here, if he gets them into field goal range, even if he does not, he's got to feel good about himself going into halftime, knowing that he has the confidence of the people in charge. You mentioned Marshall Broda knows the psyche of a quarterback, and, and how big can that be to boost a guy's confidence? I mean, he's 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 coached some of the great ones. Well, of course, and people forget that Ted Marshall Broda was a quarterback for the Detroit Lions, so he certainly understands the position. All right, the Colts with one timeout left, and Lamont Warren gets his first carry of the game the clock continuing to run well now that's interesting after all of that conversation talking about <laughs> confidence to hand the ball off and run out the clock then all of a sudden we've set up <laughs> Ted Archer Broda with the great closing series of what perhaps could have been in the first half but the score is 14 13 and we'll send you to Greg Gumbel in our NFL live studios now you take a look at the statistics and what stands out Coors Light statistics, what stands out, of course, is the rushing yards by Marshall Falk, 91 of those 97 yards. But three big turnovers on the part of the Colts, two of them interceptions by Mikowski in the end zone, or the Colts, Dan, could be up considerably more than they are here at halftime, just the one point. Falk has the 91 yards rushing, and we'll also mention that Chris Warren has 50 yards rushing for the Seahawks. They will kick off John Casey with a couple of field goals. For Seattle and back deep for the Colts, Duell Brewer and Ronald Humphrey. Both clubs five and seven and both in need of a win to keep some slim playoff hopes alive. This is Ronald Humphrey who fumbles it again and gets across the 25, but Ronald Humphrey also accounts for one of the Colts' turnovers besides the two interceptions. He also had the fumble earlier in the game. Well, whatever what inevitably, inevitably happens, Dan, easy for me to say, is that when a mistake is made early, you try and make up for it. You're trying hard. Right there, Humphrey, just make the catch, get upfield, get 10 yards. But because of the earlier mistake, a lot of times players feel compelled to make things happen and try harder than they need to. I'm sure that's part of the encouragement he's getting on the sideline is, hey, relax, just play the game. Colts up by a point. We'll begin the first series of the second half at the 26. And Falk, who was already over the 1,000-yard mark for the season, gets stopped in the backfield. We saw him get stopped in the backfield more than a couple of times in the first half, and that time Sam Adams brings him down for a loss. First-round pick out of Texas A&M. He was the man that supposedly was going to take the pressure off of the Tez. But thus far, it really hasn't transpired. Just to give an idea, and of course, Adams has been injured this year, just to give an idea of the problems that the Seattle Seahawks have had in the pass rush, that man, number 98, Sam Adams, leads the team in sacks with only three. Just 18 total coming in. That ranks 26 to the NFL. Mikowski back to pass, threads the needle. And he's got Roosevelt Potts out of the backfield. Roosevelt Potts. And that is the first pass that Potts has caught in the last three games. What's well, the guy that we just mentioned taking the pressure off of? There's number 96, Cortez Kennedy. Every time he comes up, there are two guys waiting, guard and center. And Cortez Kennedy is frustrated by that, as you can tell. I mentioned the numbers that he had two years ago. Has he measured up? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that he's double teamed. But let's not forget that a lot of great players were in the league are double teamed. Cortez is just going to have to overcome it. Third down and five. Mikowski trying to convert. Floyd Turner can't hang on and complete. The Colts will punt it away.
Seattle attempting to generate some pass rush there came with a blitz of the middle linebacker Spotolsky. What? Look at the happy feet. A little bit hesitant there. Mikowski drills it. That's a very catchable ball. And fairness to Mikowski, Turner should have come up with that one. So Ron Stark punts again. Kelvin Martin back at his 23. And Stark hanging this one. Drops at the 36. And that is about where the Colts will doubt it. And that's where Seattle will begin. Putting moments of the third quarter. Dan Hicks, Todd Christensen, Kingdom in Seattle. Seahawks trail the Colts. 14-13, Dan McGuire in for the injured Rick Meyer. And he'll hand off to Chris Warren, and Warren with a good hole. Warren up to the 44, still on his feet, close to the 45. At the end of the last play, you're saying to themselves, why was the big deal? Why was the big deal watch as Paul Butcher just jumps all over the ball? Now, I'll explain it to you, it's easy. Those who happened to watch earlier in the season, New Orleans and Los Angeles Rams, remember that Robert Bailey, when they just batted the ball around, picked it up in the end zone and returned a punt 103 yards for a touchdown. So just because Devin McDonald touches the ball in midair does not mean it's dead until the official comes over and blows the whistle. I think Bailey's return is going to have all of the special teams people paying attention to the future. Or maybe they just have a great special teams coach at Wayne State. Paul just a point, Tom. Second down is short. Warren will try to pick up the first down along the far side. Turns the corner. He's got the ball to midfield. Flags come flying in as Ray Buchanan makes the stop on Warren. Looks like a holding call. My holding call. I think it's going to be against Blackshear. If not, if not, it might be a clip. Now that now the, the talking face mask. And okay, I'll get it. It's one of those. We'll make it official right now. We've been told that Rick Meyer will not return today. Johnny Greer. We have multiple fouls on the offense. Holding number 87 is declined. Face mask number 69 will be accepted. So the face mask is on Jeff Blackshear. The holding call on Paul Green. Watch Blackshear and watch his right arm come up and grab the face mask there of, of Stephen Grant, look at the face mask get pulled back. The official's flag comes in, and that's the one that they prefer. And of course, earlier, as he mentioned, Chris Green, or excuse me, Paul Green with the hole. There is Blackshear, the gigantic left guard in his second year out of Northeast Louisiana, 6'6, 323 pounds. He has started every game since the open. So now, second down and 16 for McGuire. And he'll go to the air, and again, the pass complete to Blades. I believe all of McGuire's completions, four and all, have gone to Brian Blades. Kind of like the song, isn't it? All the stars out tonight. I don't know if it's cloudy or bright. I only have eyes for you, clearly. Brian Blades is the man that McGuire is looking for nearly every time he fades back to throw, and why not? With those four catches now, five in total, he's got 69 grabs on the season, well on his way to breaking his own team record. Another flag has been dropped. And yet not another official powwow. We've seen a lot of these this season. Unsportsmanlike conduct on the Seattle bench. Good here. Mm. Now I know it wasn't on that man. It must have been because having played for that man for nine years, I know that he's or ten years rather. I know that that man's not terribly vocal. There must have been some pretty big commotion on the bench to warrant a penalty. There must some players, some players over there really running their mouths. Tom Flores. One of the most gentlemanly coaches in the National Football League. So some player must have said something a little off color. You see it in baseball. The umpire coming over the dugout to calm down. Players not on the playing field. But I don't think uh, I can remember a football game situation where 
Well, one of the things that they're concerned with, not unlike the NBA, Dan, is a lot of the taunting, a lot of the running their mouths, and a lot of the jawing that's going on, and they're trying to prohibit that a little bit. But again, you know, it's uh, I, I think in a situation like that, if I'm the official, I don't have rabbit ears. I just that old adage when they're kids, right? Sticks and stones, and names will never hurt me. I mean, you got to let that go. Still talking. And while they continue to discuss the penalty, we've been we'll talking about Brian Blades. As I say, Dan, we've been talking a lot about Brian Blades and his productivity, two of the three best seasons, and which is interesting because I think most people would assume that Steve Largent certainly had to have that the record. The unsportsmanlike conduct foul on the bench. It's a succeeding spot foul. The down counts. Third down. We get the explanation from Johnny Greer, and this is probably the loudest the crowd has been today, Dan. Not very happy about it. Somewhat an implacable Tom Flores is just letting it go, not making an issue of it. Seemingly always stolen Tom Flores. Now his team really backed up at the 20. Third down and 26. Absolutely not. Now, now, Bates comes over to argue with the side judge, but he's the one that ran up the back of Eugene Daniel. There's no beef at all. Take a look at the end of the play. Entitled his position. He stumbles down. He doesn't collide with Bates. Bates waving the arms a little bit. The ball wasn't catchable. Good non-call by the official. Bates, the speedster who they've been trying to incorporate into the uh, Dan, wide receiving sets for Seattle. I, this is a personal thing with me. I'm just getting so tired of these receivers that are begging any time they get bumped. I, it, it wearies me. Bumped by two from Joel Brewer from the 34, and we'll get no farther than the 39. Five-yard return for Brewer. The stop by Dean Wells. Indianapolis with 11-10 left in the third quarter. Hangs on to the one-point lead over Seattle. In Seattle, Indianapolis with a one-point lead over the Seahawks. 11-10 left in the third quarter. Mikowski and the Colts will begin this drive from their own 39. Mikowski with a couple of interceptions in the first half. Coming up next Sunday on NBC Sports NFL Live, of course, begins at 12.30 Eastern time. And then these Indianapolis Colts against the New England Patriots. And the Patriots, with a huge win today over the New York Jets, continue to try and make the playoffs as we look at the up-to-date wild card scramble. it to Marshall Falk, and Falk will be short of the first down. He needed to get to midfield. Dan, if I'm not mistaken, that's his first catch, isn't it? It is. And the reason I mention that is because so many times they've been putting him in the slot, and I'm saying to myself, well, that's great, but, you know, you can only play the guys at decoy so often, finally get him the ball out in the flat and give him a chance at what he does best, and that's run with the football after the catch. Came in as uh, the Colts' leading receiver with 44 receptions. Rufus Porter with a host of other Seahawks. Excellent pursuit. Cornered ball. He never had a chance to turn the corner. It's interesting about Rufus Porter. Six foot one, 227 pounds. He may have looked at that. You see him right there, number 97. That's not a big person. And you figure there's got to be a mismatch when you put the 300 or 310 pounder on him. But he, his quickness is such that it is not a mismatch. Inevitably, he's able to beat the bigger people. And he certainly did on that play. Colts opening drive of the second half stalls. Ron Stark on and get the punt. This punt. Martin calling 
for the clear catch at the nine. The veteran Stark does his job. 9.51 remaining in the third. Midway point of the third quarter. The Colts, two touchdowns in the first half, still holding up for the one-point lead over Seattle. Ron Stark has really pinned the Seahawks back for their opening drive of the second half. They'll begin at the 10-yard line where Dan McGuire, the former number one pick back in 91, continues to fill in for Rick Meyer. Again, a fractured left thumb. Rick Meyer will not return in this game. And McGuire goes down, fumbles the football, and the Colts have it at the five-yard line. Costly turnover. Tony Siragusa makes the hit on McGuire, the ensuing fumble, and the recovery made by Tony McCord. Well, again, we mentioned earlier that Siragusa from the nose tackle right over Blackshear 69. Watch the move that he makes. Puts him into the backfield. Pushes him right into the back of McGuire. And at the same time is able to strip the ball from him. Siragusa just having an outstanding football game, both against the run and the pass. Third turnover on the day for Seattle. Two fumbles, also an interception. The Colts failed to take advantage of the first fumble in the first half. They were deep in Seattle's territory, but they were not as deep as they are now at the five. Marshall Falk up the middle. He'll get down to the two. And have your eyes on Marshall Falk here. This is the man who has more touchdowns than anybody in the AFC. Unlike a lot of teams that may go with somebody who is their designated touchdown guy, like a 240 or 250 pounder, they don't do that because they feel that Marshall Falk has a nose for the end zone. He certainly, he certainly witnessed that by the number of touchdowns he has thus far. Man. Second down and goal. The pitch to Falk. Trying to get in. Did he get in? There's been no indication. He'll be short. And he's inside the one. That'll bring up third and goal. Dean Wells and Eugene Robinson did an excellent defensive job preventing Falk to get in, but Falk really tried to make it get across the plane. Give credit to the defense stretching it out. Yes, Falk has speed, but look at the pursuit. And once again, we mentioned him, Terry Wooden, playing some outstanding football. Forces Falk to the outside. Now they come up third and one. Marshall Falk, 11 total touchdowns, 10 rushing touchdowns. All but two of his touchdowns have come at home. There's been no indication. Well, no indication. It appears Falk is short. If there's no indication, then it's not a touchdown. It looked like the Falk had a chance to lean the ball over for the touchdown. Take a look at number 28. Instead of jumping, sidesteps right there. Instead of leaning the ball forward, he keeps it pressed to his chest. And as a result, he's not over for the touchdown. Now it's fourth and one. And a look for Marshall Falk over the top. Makowski with a sneak, and he's got the touchdown. On fourth and goal. The Colts come up with a big play. Well, I mentioned Marshall Falk over the top because of the fact that, as, as we mentioned, he had been scoring all of the touchdowns. Mikowski sneak, of course, surprised everybody, and the fisticuffs now make no sense. The touchdown's already been declared. Mikowski with his third touchdown of the season. Going to split backs, that spreads people out. Everybody looking at number 28, and as soon as the ball is snapped, take a look at Mikowski sneaking over. This really surprised the Seattle defense. So the score, 20 to 13, Biasucci will come on to try to make it 21-13 and an eight-point lead for the Colts. Well, that makes sense. Force them to go for the two-point conversion instead of yourself. Biasucci's got it. And the Colts come up with a scoring drive. Eight minutes left in the third. Three Seahawks injured in a tragic car crash on Thursday night along with Chris Warren and rookie running back Lamar Smith. Doctors have said after surgery on Friday that uh, Mike Fryer will likely never walk again. There's been a lot of speculation as to the neck injury that Fryer suffered. And after this kick,
kickoff returned by Terrence Warren. He brings it across the 30, 40, midfield. Warren into full territory at the 46. But we have uh, Dr. Bob Berry, a spinal surgeon from Harborview Trauma Center in here to clear up some of the speculation. A lot of talk about the neck injury, doctor, but can you explain the neck injury first to Mike Pryor? Okay, Dan, what happened to Mike Pryor is he suffered a severe fracture dislocation of his cervical spine, as seen here on the spine model. He had an acute angulation which stretched and then severely crushed the spinal cord. This has resulted in partial loss of the function of both arms and complete loss of the function of both legs. Warren gets the call on first and 10. And Bob, what are the prospects of Mike Fryer's injury as far as returning to a normalcy of life? Will he walk again? Or? After a short stay in the hospital, he'll be referred to a spinal rehabilitation center uh, where he will be taught uh, how to deal with the disability of uh, not being able to use both lower extremities. It is unlikely at this time that Mike will be able to use uh, his legs. How he does will depend on his level of motivation, uh, support, and uh, his background. Thank you, Doctor. Second down and six. This one running for another Seahawk first down. And we got the feeling, Todd, that. Uh, that Mike Fire was in a good state of mind uh, when at least Tom Flores visited him in the hospital. Dr. Ferry, I'm interested in knowing how would you contrast this particular injury with the injury suffered by Dennis Bird? Dennis Bird suffered a partial spinal cord injury, which acts more like the spinal cord being stunned rather than crushed. He had an excellent chance from the beginning from a near total recovery with the nerves and the cord being intact. As con uh, contrasted to Mike Pryor, uh, who has had an interruption of his neurological impulses uh, caused by either a severance or severe crushing of the cord. Does this, does this look more like the injury that Mike Utley suffered? Absolutely. Mike Utley suffered a, a complete injury uh, to the cord with little or no recovery in his ambulation abilities. In fact, uh, Mike Utley has attempted to, to get a hold of, of Mike Pryor and wish him luck on his recovery. We thank you, Dr. Bob Berry, for your insight into the injuries of Mike Pryor. Second down and nine for Seattle on this drive. And McGuire throwing the needle to Brian Blades, but a flag comes in. Quentin Coriot brings Blades down. And we'll once again hear from Johnny Greer. Holding 69, offense. Still second down. And a holding call again on Jeff Blackshear. Not not his best day today. Gives up the sack to Saragusa that causes the fumble. Once again, number 69 on Saragusa gets some help, but there's the takedown. Clearly a takedown, no doubt about it. The umpire right on top of it. The Seattle Seahawks have been penalized nine times for 89 yards. The Colts have yet to pick up a penalty. Second down at 19, the swing to Green, Green, nowhere. Excellent defensive play led by Ray Buchanan. Well, what I don't understand about this, of course, Paul Green, pretty good pass-catching tight end, but this is the sort of thing you want to get out in the flat to one of your runners. You want to get your good runner out there, and Ray Buchanan at 5'9", 185, says to the 6'3", 230-pounder, big deal, down you go. Trev Alberts is in the defensive unit for Indianapolis. There's a look at the working from Nebraska. Third down and 20. Seattle just three of 10 on third down conversions today. Wire. Right into the hands of Ashley Ambrose. And Ambrose cuts back across and gets it down to the 30 of Seattle. The center, Ray Donaldson, had to make the stop on Ambrose. 
Well, it's good protection. The throw a little bit, well, more than just a little bit short, right into the hands of Ambrose. It looked like there might have been somebody in his face that might have got a piece of his arm, but Ambrose, not unlike Buchanan, has a pretty good run back before Ray Donaldson, the center, and former Indianapolis Colt makes the stop. Second interception of the day for the Colts secondary. Buchanan had the first one, returned it for a touchdown, and Ambrose picks up his second interception, second of his career. And the Colts in business at the Seahawk 30. Marshall Falk can't handle the pitch, still doesn't have it. Ball still loose. Makowski diving in. And the Seahawks have it back. This is an error on the part of Marshall Falk all the way. He decides at the last minute that he wants to go elsewhere. It looks like he was expecting a handoff. Instead, he got a pitch. Scrambling for the ball, Mikowski looks like he has him, but then it spins out. And right there at the end, there's nothing but blue shirts. You see the smile on his face. I really think that Marshall Falk thought he was going to get a handoff. Instead, it was the pitch. And that's where the ball went awry. We've witnessed eight turnovers in this ball game, four by each team. Jason Belser makes the stop from his free safety position. Well, for somebody who just broke ribs a couple of days ago, he is certainly putting in a great effort. 21 carries on the day for Chris Warren, and he's over the 70-yard mark. And with Rick Meyer out injured, Warren should get a lot more carries before this one is through. 3.36 left in the third quarter. Colts on top, 21-13. He is again. He's got the first down. Well, clearly the problems that the offensive line for the Seattle Seahawks have had have been in the passing game. Every time McGuire has gone back to pass the last couple of series, bad things have happened. And so Larry Kennan, the offensive coordinator, said, heck, let's give this a break. Let's get Warren the ball. Keep it between the tackles. Let's also mention that John Vaughn was released on Monday. Vaughn apparently upset with his playing time. And Flores had had enough. Flores' quote was, we didn't agree on a few things. So Vaughn was released on Monday, and it's left the running back position for the Seahawks. McGuire going for Bates. Can't come up with a catch. Tate and Daniel were with Bates. Good protection for Dan McGuire here on the out and up route to Michael Bates. Gets hit right at the last minute on his right leg. Spinning off of the block. That may have taken a little of the juice off the ball because he has Bates. You see, he now has to come back for the ball. Tate was in the way, but that was a very catchable ball by Bates, who couldn't come up with it. Second down and ten. And this is Matt Strong. way down to the full 30. Stephen Grant brings him down, but with John Vaughn out of the lineup, Max Strong was the guy that got his first start today. Left side of the offensive line doing the job. Look at Steve Smith. Great cut block on Tate, enabling him to spring forward and get the extra yardage. Steve Smith, number 35, former of the Los Angeles Raiders, one of the great blocking fullbacks in the National Football League. And it's Max Strong again. A flag comes in. And I don't know if the Seahawks got the playoff or not. Now it's a holding call against Seattle. So the trend continues. If you saw the reaction. Dan, I was going to say, if you saw the reaction of Tom Floyd, he's not normally terribly demonstrative. Holding 73 offense. Still first down. So now you saw him throw up his hands a little bit of despair 
The left tackle, Ray Roberts, is the man. Tony Bennett beats him with the move. Look at the right leg. He just right there, he tackles him, gets a piece of his leg. That's what the official saw him through the flag. Ten penalties now against Seattle. Almost 100 yards, and the Colts still have been penalized. The whole football field of penalties. McGuire has Steve Smith out of the backfield. Smith with his first reception of the game. And 24th reception of the season. Well, Steve Smith is a fairly effective pass catcher coming out of the backfield. Back in 1988, when he was with the Raiders, he had eight touchdowns. And I mention that only because fullbacks ordinarily are not people that produce those kinds of numbers. He also, also had over 50 catches that particular season. So Steve Smith can make some viable contributions, both for running and the passing game. Chris Warren back in the backfield. And he'll get the pitch. Excellent play by Ray Buchanan. Took Warren one-on-one -on -one and was not juked and puts the clamps on it. Well, this is starting to turn into the Ray Buchanan show, the 5-foot, 990-pounder. You don't think of corners as being hitting guys. We saw the fit he put on Green earlier. Now take a look at the shot he puts on Warren. 6'3", 230 pounds, and again, down he goes. Buchanan proves that he's the total package. A lot of guys that you get at the corner can only do one or two things. They can either come and support the run, or they cover. Buchanan does both. You make the point of total package. Ray Buchanan told us last night, he says, I like three guys in the way they play. I like the entertainment from Deion Sanders, the aggressiveness of Rod Woodson, and the respect that Donald Wolford gets. Wire, who is very close to being sacked, just trying to get rid of it. And, and just as you talked about it, that's the man that came out of the corner sack and made the play is Ray Buchanan. I tell you what, they're talking about Rod Woodson in terms of the total package, in terms of blitz supporting the run and cover, but take a look at number 34. Watch from the left of your screen. Here he comes. Young man gets all the way to the outside, chops down the six foot eight inch tree that is Dan McGuire. The lateral was a little bit too late. That was the aggressiveness of Rod Woodson. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. They say, I'm going to have a big game and some big plays. Happens like <laughs> every week, but the guy never comes through. Not so Ray Buchanan. He talks the talk, and he walks the walk. And now Seattle punting it away. Duell Brewer awaiting Rick Tittman's punt. Excellent punt. Bounce. And Seattle will down it at the 19. Raphael Robinson making the stop. The playoff picture as promised. Now here's my opinion on this, Dan, and that is that the home field advantage is going to be crucial. And clearly it is not going to be in Buffalo, which has been a big deterrent to the other teams in the AFC. I really like Pittsburgh here, not simply because they've won, they have 10 wins, but their clutch games down the stretch are at home. They've got Cleveland at home. They've already beaten Miami, so if it evens out where that's concerned, and then at the end of the season, they play Pittsburgh, play San Diego, last game of the season. That could determine home field advantage throughout the playoffs. The winner of that game, I would have to say, would be a favorite. Kowski hands off to Paul. We mentioned that uh, Pittsburgh did beat Cincinnati today. Cleveland is playing the Giants, and they trail 10-6 in the third quarter. Well, this and is a, New England with a big win over the Jets today to and, get over the 500 mark. And Dan, this is a big toss-up here because what are the teams that have momentum? New England clearly is the team that have moment that has momentum. Remember last year, even though they had the poor record down the stretch in December, New England played some great football. So take a look at those that Patriot team as somebody that's coming on as witnessed by the establishment of the running game today for the Pats. Murkowski, he's got Potts over the middle, and Potts is close to a first down. Just short. Nice sliding catch there by Potts. Well, there is Rick Meyer who fractured his left thumb in the Ray Buchanan interception for the touchdown in street close. Sitting next to Browning Nagel, the third street quarterback. Potts will try to get the first down and he'll lumber for it. Ooh. 
Sitting next to Rick Meyer is Stan Gelbaugh, the starting quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks in that very miserable 1992 season, celebrating his 32nd birthday today. I actually chatted with him on the field beforehand. He's a happy man, happy to be employed and happy to be here in Seattle. He was the quarterback for those really hardcore football fans of the London Monarchs under Larry Cannon during the year of their championship. Good correction. I misidentified him as a Stan Gilball, but Sean Dawkins, the intended receiver for Mikowski, incomplete. Sean Dawkins is somebody that they are really looking to for big plays, but the very thing that we talked to him about yesterday is the very thing that's transpiring today. How many times have we called his number? Not very often. They have been unable to get him the ball consistently, and having been a receiver, I can tell you that if you're not thrown to at least on a semi-consistent basis, then you lose interest. And, and Sean Dawkins told us everybody thought I'd be the next Jerry Rice. I came into the league. Everybody had high hopes for me, but I'm really one of those guys that comes along a little slower. Second down and ten. This is Lamont Warwick up the middle across midfield and dragging him down from behind was Robert Blackman, who was lucky to get him in his grasp. Or Warren, Warren may have gone the distance. We used to call this scissors at five when I was in college. The fake pitch and the cross buck underneath the Warren. Great blocking on the part of the Colts. A play that they have not run yet today. Completely surprising the defense. Blackman, in his attempt to strip the ball from Warren, gives him an additional 10 yards on the run. 35 yards on the pickup in total, and the Colts at the Seahawks 36. Clark will get nowhere. Flag down. At the line of scrimmage. Seattle. Now here we are anticipating that it might have been the Colts first no, penalty no. instead. No, no, no <laughs> way. Offside against the Seahawks. It's almost comical the way it's now that stacked man. up against Seattle. Offside, 97, defense, lining up in the neutral zone, still first down. You have to give a lot of credit to this man for what he has endured. I've mentioned a couple of times the 1992 season. Now the tragedy that has befallen the team with regards to this car wreck. When he was with the Raiders, he suffered through the deaths of people John, like John Matuzak, Lyle Alzado, and of course the tragic car wreck of Stacey Turan. A strong man has to deal with that sort of thing. On first and five, Falk will get the first down. Look at the burst of speed up the sidelines. Robert Blackman ran him out. One of the things they say in all sports, Dan, is that you can't teach speed. Take a look at the cut here. Most running backs would be tackled right about here, but instead, look at the gear that he has. Tony Brown saying to himself, I thought I was fast. Didn't I run like 4-4 in training camp? Why is it I have no way of catching number 28? And Falk is over the 100-yard mark. 110 yards now. The season best is 143. got held in the process and Dan. another flag is down I think by this point you mentioned earlier that he was going to surpass his career best for tackles I believe he's done it today he has just had an outstanding football game for the Seahawks hey what do you know and listen to the crowd, <laughs> the crowd. now what's impressive about this is this is a knowledgeable group of people I can tell you that from experience having played for 10 straight years up here in Seattle these people know football and so when they finally get one <laughs> penalty, they give it the mock raspberry cheer. I tell you what, that's an astute group. <laughs> oh, first penalty of the game called against the visiting Colts. Holding 75 offense. Still first down. And Cecil Gray, who's filling in for Zephyrus Moss, picks it up. Now remember, that's the second holding penalty against Cecil Gray, but the first time, of course, they declined it because of the Eugene Robinson interception. And so... <laughs> it's very entertaining that the crowd was able to pick that up. Watch the top of your screen, number 75, gets beat by Sam Adams and has the arm completely around his waist. Good call by the official. Mikowski uh, with the play clock dwindling down to the final seconds had a quick conference with Roosevelt Potts, who might have been a little confused. 
Boy, th this has certainly not been, from a play-calling standpoint, that man's best day. He's been struggling a little bit. Now he gets a chance to talk with the coaches. Back in Seattle, the Colts at the Seahawks, 25. First down and 23. They lead it 21 to 13. Are you a fan of that come wasting the timeout? I think in some situations, I'm saying some situations of the game go, okay, we blew it. We'll take the five yards. Well, there's, there's still you know 11 saying? minutes left. All right, and it's first They still day. have two timeouts left. Right. You don't want to do anything stupid this deep in territory. Okay. Ter 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 I, th I think there are times in the game where you should just take the timeout. Lukowski well, already has a couple of interceptions. Inside the 20. Tony Brown, who is making his second straight start at the left corner position, makes the stop as we look at Falk's projected rushing total at the top of the screen, over 1,200 yards. Well, at the way he was going with, with receiving as well, he was close to 2,000 yards. His average, you see there, to reach the coveted 2,000-yard mark, which really is significant for a back to get 2,000 total yards from scrimmage. Today, he's pretty close. 25 yards in total. And he's got his fourth 100-plus rushing effort of the season. Makowski firing to the end zone, and what, what a, a catch, catch by Sean Dawkins. Oh, man. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> a weak spike, but what a catch. Wow. Last week against the New England Patriots, that's the identical route that they ran for a touchdown, the deep slant route to Dawkins. But as you mentioned, what a catch. Mikowski with the five-step drop, plants, quickly throws the ball. Look at the extension. Jeez. Right there on the fingertips. Great catch by Dawkins. And here's a guy that has dropped a few in his early career and has really made a habit. <laughs> Look at the... <laughs> yeah, it was creative. It's Will it's you give it a, a okay. 10? Uh, no, I'm Nine not going to give it a 10. for impression. <laughs> yeah, right. Cosmopolitan, maybe. Girl, maybe. 27-13. And Biasucci makes it 28-13. Sean Dawkins with an acrobatic catch and an even better slide down in the end zone. 16-yard touchdown reception from Don Mikowski has lengthened the Colt lead to 15 with 10-20 left in the final quarter. And there is a look at the former number one pick in his second year out of Cal. So you so kind of like the ice skating, you're giving that, that big six for originality. Absolutely. If I've never seen it, it's okay. worth it. That's okay. Of I'll give you that. I'm just I'm from the I'm from that Paul Brown school of uh, you know, act like you've been there before. Be a Suchi to kick off. Bates and Warren away. down by Charles Arbor. As promised, the NFC playoff picture, the Dallas Cowboys winning today, 31 to 19 over Philadelphia to up their mark to 11 to 2. They clinch the division title. San Francisco was the first team in the NFL to clinch a playoff spot, and down we go with a couple of eight and five teams. So the question basically is this, is it, uh, is it Dallas and San Francisco in the 26 dwarfs? And what do you think? Is there somebody that you're not going to <laughs> Not at this point in the season. Time. Over the middle and complete. He wanted Brian Blades. And we'll get back to the NFC playoff picture and the scramble for a wild card spot. And here's where it really gets interesting. Philadelphia losing today. The they dropped to seven and six. It's amazing, you know. It, it, I always find it fascinating how the season unfolds. Don't forget, wasn't Philadelphia seven and two yeah. at one point? Yeah, they, the they, people were talking about that they, they were up they there with San the other two. What forty-one to eight? Or same thing with eight. Minnesota. They're saying the same thing, but they're all at this point. You'd have to consider that they're all pretenders. You know, as we look at Brian Blades, a bit shaken up. I think the big question in the NFC, Dan, is simply where's the game going to be played? Is the NFC who's going to have a home Irving? Field advantage? Or Irving Candles for San Francisco. And like him or hate him, Deion Sanders has made a big difference in the 49ers. 
McGuire wanted to run it out, but Tony McCoy says, I don't think so. Six feet, 279 pounds, Tony McCoy into the six foot eight frame of Dan McGuire. Well, it's six eight and 240 running is not McGuire's strong suit. Seeing the field, look at the mobility, steps forward, McCoy says, maybe not. Number 61, right in the middle. That's textbook tackling there, too. Face mask right between the one and the zero. And that'll be a sack for Tony McCoy. I'll be his mark to four on the season. Career. And it's Buchanan they with the recovery. Who? Amazing. Already with an interception. And now with a fumble recovery. Ray Buchanan. Well, Ray Buchanan comes off the corner, the top of your screen. He gets blocked. There he is at the last minute, along with Foryat, I believe it was. Stripped the ball from him. Look at the athletic ability and how nimble he is to bounce up off the ground and make the recovery. And the Colts, with 9.24 left in the game, a chance to really put it away here. They lead by 15. As we look at Rick Meyer, fractured left thumb. Toward the end of the first half, has not returned. And Marshall Falk dancing along the right side is inside the five. Second down and goal. Take a look close and see if his arm was going forward. There's the arm, and just as it was about to go forward, Buchanan up on top gets the shoulder. Buchanan has just been all over the field. Take a look, there's 34 at the top. Watch right there, just as he pulls on the shoulder, that's when the ball pops loose. And so the arm goes forward, but the ball was already gone. Good Tony call Bennett. by, good call by Johnny Greer, the official, and Tony Bennett on the bottom, making the sack. get down inside the three and that'll bring a third down and goal we'll look for play action here which I think would be a little bit predictable at the three yard line but clearly they wanted to get Falk a touchdown here down close inside the 10 yard line I would guess here though the Marshall Broda wants to go with some sort of play action pass Falk already with his fourth 100 yard game and Brian Blades Remember yeah, the last series, 100 yards of reception last week. Eligible receiver. Dan, I was about 79. to say. 79. I was about to say that remember earlier in that drive, he's the one that missed the pass over the middle, fitting back a little bit. I'm sure that's what he's doing. And Mikowski rolling. For the end zone, and he could not hook up with Kerry Cash. Well, Cash Mikowski, was wide open. I was about to say, Mikowski has to thank his buddy Ray Buchanan because... Cash is wide open in the end zone, maneuvering. He's supposed to run the corner. Watch to the right of your screen. He's rolling out. Initially, he wants to get Falk. There you can see he just goes fast. Now, watch Cash and Wood. He's got the entire end zone to work with. Wide open. How can that be? How can he throw that ball that far behind him? Certainly, this is a day that Don Mikowski, despite the victory, the impending victory, rather, by the Colts, he'd like to forget. So, we'll see Dean Biasucci for the first time. Biasucci adds to the Colts total and they up their lead to 31-13. Command at the midway point of the final quarter, 31-13. Biasucci with a 21-yard field goal for the current score. And next Saturday at 3.30 Eastern time, Troy Aikman, Charles Haley, the offensive story and the defensive story. We'll meet at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time next week. We mentioned Dallas already with a win today which has clinched the nfc east spot the giants in cleveland by the way new york leading cleveland 13 to 6 right now but the remaining schedule for cleveland and the pittsburgh steelers who are vying for the afc central don't forget you saw the grad you saw the pictures there of the dallas cowboys and cleveland browns i tell you what they should have some of those defenders up there pepper johnson nearly 150 tackles eric turner in my opinion should be the pro bowl free safety 
very good return. He's marked out of bounds at the 45 and will send you to our New York studios and join Greg Gumbel. All right, Dan, in Kansas City, here's how the Chiefs play catch-up against the Broncos. Steve Bono, 63-yard touchdown play to Willie Davis, made it 17-15. Bono says go for two. And again, Willie Davis on the receiving end. They're tied at 17, under four minutes to play at Arrowhead Stadium. Dan and Todd, back to you. All right, Greg, thank you. Denver trying to resurrect its season after the 0-4 start. Difficulty hanging out of the football. So getting back to Cleveland's defense, you think that defense is absolutely for real. And how far could it carry the Browns though with the offense? Well, I think I think that's the big issue because the ball start on the center prior to the snap, a double clutch, still first down. The inconsistency that's Ray Donaldson, the inconsistency of Vinny Testaverde and, and, and Metcalf and some of the others. They have really not been able to coordinate what they want to do offensively, but their special teams are fabulous, great kick returns, great coverage. People, Benny Thompson, who I think is the best cover guy in football right now, Eric Metcalf, they've, they've got a chance. First and 15, McGuire's got Rob Thomas, and Rob Thomas has his very first catch of the season as we check back at the remaining schedule for the Browns and the Steelers. Well, you've got to say that it's more difficult for Cleveland if for whatever reason a loss today to the Giants would be absolutely horrible for them because you got to figure that at best in the next two weeks they would split Dallas and Pittsburgh both away games. So the Pittsburgh Steelers on the other hand catch a Philadelphia team who's not playing particularly well. They get Cleveland at home and of course end the season in San Diego. And basically, if Cleveland were to win today, that could possibly, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, make the game in San Diego mood in terms of winning the division. Face pass call against Paul Green, which will bring his, what would have been a first down reception back. Face mask, number 73, 15 yards, still second down. Ray Roberts, the left tackle there, negating Green's catch. And we'll take this opportunity to let you know about the Bryant Blades injury. He is in the locker room there, X-raying the ribs. So Brian Blades out of the ball game. What? I know this. I know this, and that must be serious to get him out of the game because that's, that's one of the toughest receivers in the game, Brian Blades. Both Meyer and Blades really most of the offense with Chris Warren out of this game. With seven minutes left and the Colts up 31 to 13. Thomas a chance to get just a second catch of the entire season. Rob Thomas, former possession receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs, son of Aaron Thomas, the old New York Giant and great. Playing primarily on special teams this season. Maybe that accounted for the reason why he struggled with that one, a very catchable ball. He's never done a season without a catch. He keeps that streak intact. down by Terrence Warren. 6.26 left. The Colts in command. Brings it to the 32. 4.10 to go. Indianapolis up 31 to 13. We mentioned that the Colts, Ted Marcher Broda told us also in our, in our conversation with him yesterday, Todd, that his team was up emotionally as much as any game last week, even though they lost the game, but this Colt team has continued to play when other times it may have packed it in in a 5-7 and seven season as all green falls in with a 
McGuire reception. But the big reason for today's victory is Ray Buchanan, the employee owners of Avis, salute him. He is the game's MVP as the winner of today's We Try Harder Award. There was this brilliant 34-yard interception return for a touchdown for Ray Buchanan. He also recovered a fumble as Paul Green calls it in, but recovered a fumble, forced a fumble, had two sacks, had two big stuffs of guys running downfield. I mean, there's nothing this guy didn't do. And you know what, Dan? And on cue, he makes another play. <laughs> and, you know, and I got to tell you, what's interesting about this is that, I'm sorry, just the one sack, but the interesting point with regards to Ray Buchanan is that, you know, in a couple of weeks, they're going to be voting for the Pro Bowl as, uh, as a Colt is down on the field. And I know that the standard thinking here with regards to the cornerback has to be Rod Woodson and Terry McDaniel. But I dare say that if that man number 34 had been playing corner the entire season, he could have some ridiculous numbers in terms of interceptions, tackles, and sacks. And let's also take into account this. Rod Woodson certainly is a great player, but he plays on a great defensive team, a team that leads the NFL in sacks, as well as Terry McDaniel, who plays in front of that and behind that great front four. So what Ray Buchanan has done for the Colts is that much more significant, I think. Injured player is uh, Tony McCoy down at the 30-yard line, but we'll remind you that following the game on most of these stations, it's an all-new Earth 2. Then Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges star the network television premiere of The Fisher King. Viewers on the West Coast will see these shows at their regularly scheduled times as they continue to attend to McCoy. We'll take another look at the Rick Meyer injury on the Buchanan interception. Be interested to see if that if that means his season or if he's if they're going to try and adjust and see if they can get him to catch some snaps and do some things here down the stretch with three games remaining. What went wrong with the Seattle season, the three and one start, and the six straight losses? Well, certainly a lot of that as we get a chance to see the injury. Look at number 61 right in the middle of your screen gets pushed back falls down it's hard to tell from that the way he was the way he was uh, his hips looked a little bit off as we take a look at some of the other scores around the NFL the Patriots with the big win over the Jets Dallas clinching the NFC East big win over Philadelphia and Pittsburgh clinching a playoff spot. They handle Cincinnati easily today. Tampa Bay follows up the Minnesota win last week with a win over Washington. And a crucial game going on right now. Denver and Kansas City tied at 17. Just about a minute left in that ball game. Detroit. Green Bay, that has been a good ball game. A lot of points. Look at the score. Look at the Look points at San, San Francisco's Francisco. putting up. It's the very thing that people are talking about with regards to the 49ers, too. Now their offensive line is healthy, and they're hitting on all cylinders. Second straight time that uh, San Francisco's really handled Atlanta, and Cleveland in a crucial game at home, getting all it can handle from the New York Giants as the Browns try to pace with the Pittsburgh Steelers and that run for the AFC Central side. And we'll take another look at the playoff picture. Again, the Steelers figure to be in along with the Chargers, Browns, and Dolphins. Big Monday night game, San Diego and the Raiders. The Raiders are 6-6, six and six, and you would have to think that they've got to play with desperation. I mean, that's everything that they've got to have on Monday night. Uh, against uh, the San Diego Chargers. There's Kansas City involved with that 17 all tie with Denver. That's a very pivotal game. What do you think of Miami's chances? I mean, tough team. I mean, they lose Keith Byers. Again, you know what? I, I have to say that the thing that stands out about Miami is like so many of the other teams, which is at, at some point in the season. I had broadcast some games where they went up to Green Bay, a very good Green Bay team, spanked them by 20. And then they have Chicago at home, a game that you think is a no-brainer, they're going to win easily, and they don't. So that sort of inconsistency leads me to believe as to what, you know, whether or not they are that good of a team. I tell you what, tonight is going to go a long way towards that, and I say that 
not just simply because of the obvious if they win, but they're the ones right now with the with the uh, with the stake, so to speak, to nail into the heart of the Buffalo Bills. In the past couple of years, they haven't been able to do it. Less than a minute left in that Denver Kansas City game, still tied at 17. Back strong on the carry for Seattle. Have Buffalo at Miami tonight. I really thought that the Miami's chances uh, weren't as good when they lost Keith Byers. I mean, that guy does so much for that team. Absolutely. I, mean, I really think he's underrated. Yeah. Locking back, Great receiver decision. out of the backfield. Before he went out, and I think it was the uh, Indian Cup. Another thing, too, is that Don Shula pointed out is that his physicality, he's a tough guy. And in the past, the Miami Dolphins have not really been known as a physical tough team. And to illustrate, a wild this year's race for the playoffs is is that coming into today's games only three teams were mathematically out of the playoffs the Bengals the Oilers and the Redskins so you have five and seven teams like these two clubs here today still alive in the first week of December well it's also again at, at this point I, I really think that you'd have to say Pittsburgh is the favorite and the reason I say that is that they've, they've gone ten and three basically on defense and special teams you know very foster a great runner as we see once again, the goose. The goose. Goose. The goose. There he is. Having a great game. Is it Pittsburgh? The Pittsburgh Steelers 10 and 3. They had to shuffle quarterbacks. They had to shuffle their star running back. And they're still winning games. I think really the key to great football teams in the National Football League are those that can win when they don't play well. And there's very few of those. And Pittsburgh really throughout the season up to this point has proven that. And I like them down the stretch. That defense sure seems to show up every game. Now. Oh, yeah. Well, ironically enough, one of the times it didn't show up, Dan, was a game that I broadcast earlier in the season here in Seattle. For whatever reason, they didn't pick the West Coast trip, and Chris Warren ran for over 120 yards. And of course, that was at the point when Seattle was three and one, and everybody's excited about what the Seahawks could do. 30 to 13 was the score in that game, and that just illustrates how quickly you can go from the fourth game of the season to now what amounts to the 13th game and have a completely different picture. Well, I think the other thing, too, that you got to give a lot of credit to, and it gets unnoticed from time to time, is Bill Cowher, the young coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. What a great job he has done with that organization. A hands-on coach, somebody that understands the psychology of the players, but not just that. He understands the X's and O's on both sides of the ball, and you don't see that that often now in the National Football League because there are so many specialists. There are the central standings, the Steelers. At 10 and 3, Cleveland involved as we speak in a battle with New York. And the AFC East. Well, that's, that is interesting, isn't it? If, my, if for whatever reason Miami were to lose the game tonight, how tight would that be? <laughs> then next week we'd have an entirely different thing to talk about. Wire to Rob Thomas, who's been quietly making some receptions. And Thomas is inside the 10 yard line of more significance though is the man who is covering there i believe that was buchanan and he's down in a heap on the 26 yard line and here we've been talking about how fabulous he has been all day gotta hope that that's not too serious man for man coverage buchanan with thomas cuts across the field watch the attempt that he makes in the dive he makes to try and break it up and see how he lands how awkwardly he lands looks like he land right on his chest difficult to say from that vantage point i'm hoping they just got that wind knocked out of it yeah you don't want to speculate but it it appears that might have been the case but we'll wait and see well the giants have added a field goal and uh, now have a 16-13 lead over the Cleveland Browns. Well, the only thing Ray Buchanan hasn't done today is usher people to the seats. I mean, he has done everything for the Colts. In fact, he's ushered a lot of people out as a result of the big plays he's made. A lot of people have left. See if we can detect. Watch in the middle. Watch how he lands. He extends himself right there. Can't get quite get. Let's see how he lands right on his chest. My, as I say, I, my guess is that he knocked the wind out of him, and now he's walking off the field under his own power. He's all right, not injured. 
you know what he was thinking as he's laying there, can't get his breath, he says, I, I can't go to Hawaii if I'm hurt. Okay, I'm okay. <laughs> Bounces or, up. or he simply says, they may take the Avis Award away from me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and that could be a first for 94. So good news is Ray Buchanan pops back up. Seahawks just trying to add a score here as we approach the two-minute warning. McGuire to the end zone, incomplete. And we have reached the two-minute warning as the pass is incomplete to Rob Thomas. The end of this game pretty much decided, but also another one decided in Cleveland. The Giants have just beaten the Browns 16-13 on Brad Del Wiso's 33-yard field goal with 23 seconds left. So a costly loss for the Cleveland Browns. And the Colts have called timeout because they opted to change their defense. We did see, however, a good thing, and that is the Ray Buchanan is okay. He is back on the field for the Indianapolis Colts, number 34. Just the wind knocked out of him. And this just in, as we continue to update the scores around the NFL, the Denver Broncos uh, just blocked a field goal of Kansas City with less than a minute left in that game at Arrowhead is headed to overtime, tied at 17. And Arizona has defeated Houston. I know that you've been on pins and needles for that one. I have. And uh, so Buddy Ryan's return to the Astrodome was a successful one. Now there's the overtime update. Critical game for both of those clubs. Critical point for two. Always the big game. And McGuire has Kelvin Martin, and he'll be down at the one. Ashley Ambrose brought Martin down before he could twist into the end zone. And it's first down. Actually, a here, here flag. Come, here comes Buchanan again. Look at the head oh, right to the head geez. of McGuire. I think that's he's a, all right. That's a 15-yard penalty, which, of course, is down to the one-yard line anyway, tacked on. Buchanan, evidently, as you pointed out, first wanted to make foul, a big play. Roughing the passer, number 34, defense. First down. And, of course, you saw that Roberts didn't appreciate Buchanan going to the head of his quarterback and pushes him down. Johnny Greer opting not to, not to flag that one. And now Buchanan coming out of the game as they go into short yardage defense. First and goal inside the one. fake to the halfback misdirection going right Steve Smith goes left finds the gap between himself and Quentin Coriat for the touchdown and we'll take this time to let you know the executive producer of NBC Sports Tommy Roy coordinating producer of the NFL on NBC John Faratsis our producer today Bill Bunnell director Bucky Guns, associate director Ray Benassi production associate Mixmaster himself, Daryl Love. Production manager Kelly Corley and a technical manager Steve McCune. And unsuccessful. 
successful is the two-point conversion attempt. Ray Buchanan, and he got, <laughs> he got an interception. <laughs> he got an interception. We're out of awards, Ray. Yeah, we already gave right. away Ray, the Avis. Ray, you got it, man. You got it. Do we have any other awards we can get? Come on, Ray. Ray Buchanan? He, he wants to keep the ball. Yeah, Ray. He wants the interception, though, He's trying it? to explain <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Let's give him a double. I, I think he should get another award. For the first time this Absolutely. season, double, double Avis, Avis Awards. Award. So that you would call this We Try Harder and Harder and Harder and Keep Look On Trying. Look at that. What a catch. What a ca now, he's so excited, he's trying to explain to the official. The field judge is calm enough to come over and says, by the way, Ray, all it means the two-point conversion is no good. That's, <laughs> did you hear him say that? <laughs> by the way. <laughs> But that, you know what? That was a well of a catch. I also want to thank our spotters today, Mike McKenna and Rod Counter, our stats man, crack stats man, Barry Culver, our stage manager, Rob Nielsen. And I'd like to thank Ray Buchanan for the show that he has put on in a relatively dull he contest. Has. He man. has. You can say that again. Forgive me. Let me take the relatively out. Now... Now, now, wait a minute. Here, here's the situation. Clearly, it's an onside kick. They've got the hands team in. Ray Buchanan will be in oh. right to where <laughs> it's going to kick because he's left-footed. Is Ray Buchanan going to recover this or what? <laughs> what? I mean, yeah, is, yeah. is it inevitable? We'll see. <laughs> way, to, way to be bold, I, I, I know he'll be in the vicinity of the football, Todd. <laughs> okay. I, I, in fact, I'll guarantee you Ray Buchanan will be in the vicinity of the football. Will he recover it? I don't appreciate it. Side kick. The drama will Ray Buchanan. Ray Buchanan got a hand on it. He got a hand on it. <laughs> well, of course he got a hand was on it. Was he in the vicinity? <laughs> was he in the vicinity? Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Dan. Yes, he was. <laughs> Number 34, that's the hands team. That's where they want the ball. They want to kick right there, the big hop. But can he come up with it? No, but he does the next best thing. Where's gets that out, Avis graphic? Gets it out of bounds. <laughs> Well, of course, of, of course he's going to be in the vicinity. He's the double Avis man. Oh, come on. you got to catch the ball. No, he points it out of bounds. <laughs> well, I didn't catch it, but it's out of bounds. Cool. Oh, uh, you know, if I was Ray Buchanan, I think I'd get a copy of this tape. Oh, are you kidding? Oh, yeah, he's got to have his buddy's tape. And watch it a few times. Pointing it out of bounds. That's crazy. Not quite good enough to get the triple Avis. This is Lamont Warren. You know, Lamont Warren, Lamont Warren put on a tremendous show for the Colts in the preseason. He had a, he had like a 70, 80-yard catch. He's, he's a player, but of course, he's going to be limited because he has to sit behind Marshall Falk. Well, look at this. Next Sunday, you can watch the world's top triathletes test their endurance in the Gatorade Ironman Triathlon. It's a grueling day, 2.4-mile ocean swim, 112-mile bike ride, capped off by a 26.2-mile marathon. And one of the intriguing stories about this year's Gatorade Ironman Triathlon is the fact that 40-year-old Dave Scott returned to the competition in an attempt to win an unprecedented seventh Ironman. He had not been there for five years and is coming back to try to win. Now, I, hey. That's quite a show over there, isn't it, I, I encourage you to check out the broadcast. Just check your local listings for the time in your area, but it is next Sunday if you're watching an early NFL game You'll see the Gatorade Iron Man Triathlon after the game before Eastern time. That sounds good. Who's hosting? And if you're watching a late NFL game, you'll see it after NFL Live at 1 o'clock Eastern time. But who's hosting? You didn't answer my question. A guy named Dan Hicks. I ah. think he's, he's hosting. You know, that, it's, a, it's a great event. I don't mean to hype it, but it, it's a fantastic event. This is the third year I've been involved in it. And it... Uh, oh, I, no, I agree. I, it's just amazing. Thanks for your enthusiasm on that. All right, Pittsburgh, 10 and 3 again, will run down the AFC Central. Cleveland with that costly loss to the New York Giants. They fall to 9 and 4. Bengals and Oilers already out of it. How, how, how precipitous a fall is it from Houston to go from 12 and 4 to 1 and 12? I mean, it's it, precipitous. Well, I mean, come on. I mean, you, you, is that all Warren Moon? I mean, that's unbelievable. Well, I, there's no doubt that, that Houston underestimated. Lamont Warren with 
23 and counting left. Well, we mentioned that Denver and Kansas City are in overtime at Arrowhead. We have tacked on another loss for Seattle. They're now five and eight. And as we mentioned earlier, the Monday night tilt between the Raiders and the Chargers looms large on a lot of fronts. And look, as I stated earlier, for the Raiders to play in a very desperate vein. When the game is at home in San Diego, you certainly have to like the way they've been playing in three of their last four games in Jack Lewis Stadium. Now, finally, the Colts will take a knee, and that should do it. Seahawks out of timeouts and trailing 31 to 19. The Colts will improve to six and seven, and as mentioned, will head to Foxborough next weekend to take on the Patriots before closing out the season at home against Miami and Buffalo. Uh, meantime, Seattle will travel to Houston and finish out the season at home against the Raiders and at Cleveland. You know, Dan, even though the Colts, more than likely, if you have to bet the house, are not going to make the playoffs, they are certainly in the role of spoiler with those three remaining games. And I doubt they're going to lose all three. I can see them beating any one of those teams down the stretch. Final score, Indianapolis wins it 31-19. We'll be back to wrap things up in just a moment. 